Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. You'll get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And when I'm not asking Bruce, hey, how big was Batista's? Well, you know. One of the things I like to do is help people save money. And if you're watching this video right now and you're in a 30 year loan, man, you're overpaying your single biggest bill and you may not even realize it. I want you to do a little experiment for me. Take your calculator out, multiply your monthly house payment by 360 payments. That's how many payments there are on a 30 year loan. That big scary number, that's your total of payments. You're looking at that number? You know you can do better. Keep more of your own money right now and go to savewithconrad.com. Or maybe you've got credit card debt. Man, it's not a matter of if I can save you money with that. Your average interest rate on a credit card is more than 20%. And by the way, all the interest you pay on those credit cards, it's not tax deductible. Whereas the mortgage interest, well, that is tax deductible. So if you owe this debt, it's up to you how to pay it back. Doesn't it make sense to get the cheapest rate possible and the greatest tax deduction possible? Find out how much money you can save right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit, even scores in the 500s can be approved, and it's no cost out of pocket. But maybe best of all, we're licensed in more than 40 states. We can help more families than ever before. But how much can we save you? Find out right now for free with a quick quote from SaveWithConrad.com. Welcome to something to wrestle with. Something to wrestle with. Bruce Pritchard. Bruce Pritchard. Well, you know. That's not a rib. She put it. Let her rip. No, you have a big There's no box of gimmicks. Rumor and innuendo. I don't deal in rumor and innuendo. It, it, it. Was he there? I was there. Say something about I don't give a shit. <laughs> I ain't scared of shit. I ain't scared of shit. Fuck him. Thank you, Bruce. I love you. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Something to Wrestle With. Out, Bruce Pritchard. Of course, I'm kidding. We do have some new content you've probably never heard before, but just as a quick reminder, I uh, sent a tweet out last night explaining that Bruce was unable to record today. We've been trying to get ahead, but in these, uh, I think Bruce said the word of the week is unprecedented in these unprecedented times. Bruce is what we like to refer to in the South as busier than a one-armed paper hanger. And, uh, he's not going to be available to record until Sunday. So hacksaw Jim Duggan is coming your way. Uh, we plan to record on Sunday and as soon as we get it finished, we'll get it posted. Follow me on Twitter. Uh, hey, Hey, it's Conrad. I'll be tweeting some live updates as I hear from Bruce and we know when we're going to start recording, I'll give you a heads up. And obviously when we finish up, I'll let you know that the clock is ticking and we're going to get that thing published as quick as we can, but to hold us over today, because I know, man, we're all looking for content and stuff to do right now. We decided to just dig into the archives a little bit. But for some new content, most of you have never heard years ago, Bruce and I decided to venture onto Patreon and we had high hopes and we were cranking out bonus content. And then of course, Bruce went back to WWE and well, that extra time really dried up. So we folded that Patreon into a brand new adfreeshows.com. It's essentially what we're calling behind the scenes, a super Patreon. It's all five of my shows. And I'll be honest, the whole idea behind doing a super Patreon is we got feedback that, man, you guys thought sometimes we had too many ads and you wish we could do something different without the ads. So here it is. You can get your shows early and ad free. And most of the shows for next week are already posted uh, at adfreeshows.com. And just to give you a quick rundown on Monday, uh, Eric Bischoff and I are going to talk about David Arquette winning the world title in WCW. And this weekend, we're actually going to have it posted a face-to-face interview. Well, you know, as close as you can do in 2020, uh, with Eric Bischoff talking to David Arquette about winning the world title, that's never happened before. And there's tons of other bonus content from Eric. He tells the behind the scenes story of what happened during his 83 days in the WWE wasn't actually 83 days, but his most recent run where he was excused uh, or invited to leave. Uh, we also sat down and talked about the AWA super clash four, which was a big pay-per-view for the AWA in their dying days. And it's sort of fun to hear from Eric, the fan, not necessarily the businessman. I mean, he was still a young upstart trying to cut his teeth in the business. And I don't know, it was fun for me. Uh, and we've got tons of other fun stuff on there. We invited all the top guys to just sort of pick Eric's brain with a zoom video chat. And for Arn Anderson, we uploaded sort of the backstage story of Van Vader getting in a fight with Paul Orndorff. And later this month, we're going to have him watch 
uh, an old tag team switch where him and Tully win the titles in the NWA back in 88. I think it was April of 88. So doing a watch along with a mind like Arn Anderson, it's just a home run. Uh, but next week's episode is already up for Arn as well. It's a hashtag ask Arn anything. And I asked him about the, uh, the artist rendering of the revivals proposed new gimmick in WWE. And you got to hear his reaction. Uh, we've got Tony Schiavone over there reviewing Tiger King, a watch along for Tiger King. That's a real thing for Tony Schiavone. And of course, sometime this weekend, we'll have backlash. Oh, six up where you get to watch Vince and Shane wrestle Shawn Michaels and God with Tony Schiavone on commentary. That should be pretty fun. We've also got uh, backlash 2000 coming your way later today. That's next week's show for Jim Ross, but also from Jim Ross, we've uploaded his whole take on the releases from the WWE that just happened. And while we were recording that show, we found out we lost Howard Finkel. There's also a great bonus episode about the plane ride from hell, which is one of our most requested topics here on something to wrestle. Bruce wasn't there, of course, which is why we've never covered it, but Jim Ross was there. And unfortunately he had to clean up the mess. Once the plane landed, he's got a great line in there. Something like, uh, Hey, you know, Mr. Perfect had a job when that plane took off. Uh, plus a little bonus hashtag ask JR anything. And of course, Bruce Pritchard contributed a bonus show last month. It was WrestleMania eight. Another one of our most requested topics on something to wrestle, but again, he wasn't there. Uh, so we put it on adfreeshows.com and sort of broke down the card. And that's what I want to do today is give you guys a peek behind the curtain of the other bonus content, because all the stuff from our old Patreon is also at adfreeshows.com and most of you have never heard Bruce's take on ending the undertaker's WrestleMania streak. That's right. WrestleMania 30, Bruce and I fired up the WWE network. Of course he wasn't there. I was in the crowd it was my first WrestleMania and what a special moment it was when Brock Lesnar beat the undertaker, ending the streak, get Bruce's take on it. So I'm going to encourage you to fire up your WWE network, pull up WrestleMania 30, get to that undertaker match and do a little watch along with us. We've got two more. Uh, bonus clips after this one. So stay tuned. The end of the streak of the undertaker WrestleMania one-on-one Brock Lesnar and the undertaker WrestleMania 30. And I didn't even go back and watch this thing all the way through because I wanted to watch it. Uh, haven't seen it in well, five years, four years. So fire it up WrestleMania 30, April 6, 2014. Give everybody a time cue here, Bruce, so they can watch along with us here on the WWE network. Well, if you go on down to the bottom and go to two hours, 15 minutes and 57 seconds, and that's where we're going to start everything off. So before we get there, we should talk about, you know, sort of where you watched this, uh, 2014, you of course had been long gone from the company at this point, but you still watched WrestleMania like everybody else, right? I I did watch this one from the comfort of my home. And when you saw. The finish. What was your reaction? Were you a Sopranos fan? Yes. Okay. Do you remember your reaction for the finale of the Sopranos when it went to black? Yes. That was my reaction here. I remember just sitting there and going, huh? They just did that. And thinking, all right. Interesting. And there was just a lot, there was a lot to process there. There was a lot to think about, you know, why now, uh, why here, why Brock and a lot of why questions, but more than anything, you know, you, you got to sit and think through the years, I, I had that battle of when to, and do we end the streak? So it was, um, it was something that was really close to me and something I had a big part of in for many, many years. So it was, I had mixed reactions. Why can't you just say you didn't fucking like it? Um, because I, because there was a big part of me that loved it. I didn't like ending the streak. I hated ending the streak, but at the same time, I loved the way they did it. You know, what's interesting to me is when you said mixed emotions, because the best description I've ever heard of that is your mother-in-law driving off a cliff in your brand new Cadillac. Yeah. See, that's fucked up, man. It's just got the car. Right. So yeah. I, I feel like that's sort of the way you just described it here, but let's talk about the actual match and the way it was received at the time. This WrestleMania 
got an overwhelming thumbs up. It got 88.7 in the observer. And this got the third best match, uh, or the third most votes on the best match poll. Of course, the three-way main event with Brian Orton and Batista was number one, followed by Brian and triple H and then Brock and undertaker came in third there, but it also came in second in the worst match poll behind the divas title. So I feel like that sort of tells you a lot about the way fans were just about the finish. Um, let's talk about what Meltzer wrote here. The crowd was so cold, maybe because the match wasn't good. Maybe because everyone knew the outcome that when Brock hit the first F five and the undertaker kicked out, there was no reaction. Even when he did it the second time, very little reaction. Then he did it a third time and referee Chad Patton, who knew the finish that everybody else thought they knew hit the mat once then twice, then didn't know what to do. He was told Undertaker was winning, but the rule every referee is told is that if the guy doesn't kick out, you continue the count. The Undertaker wasn't kicking out. There was slight hesitation, which is why people were confused because he was confused, but he did his job. It was at that point that time stood still and Lesnar whispered in Undertaker's ear. Thank you. It was once in a lifetime, at least for this streak. And he compares it in the observer to the unbeaten streaks of Anderson Silva or Fado or Emelianenko or Bruno San Martino. And there were a lot of conflicting reports, according to Dave, about how many people knew what was happening. Even when undertaker got in the ring, possibly, and people really did think this was the last time and going back a few years, people had talked about this match was going to happen at WrestleMania 27. And they sort of teased that if you remember at a UFC where Brock was leaving the cage undertakers there, and they do a little stare off and, and Ariel Hawani caught all of this on camera. Did you see that UFC interaction? And did you assume, oh, that's money. They're building to something. Yeah. I saw the interaction and uh, yeah, I naturally assumed that that's where they were going. Of course that didn't wind up happening. And everybody thinks that they know the finish on the 31st. I mean, everybody knows that's what's going to happen or everybody's led to believe that. And they even cart out a bunch of caskets for undertaker's entrance with one for each of his opponents. And there's one for Brock Lesnar. Uh, Metz would write what happened after that was a little fuzzy. Only a few people knew before Sunday, if the ref himself wasn't told before the match, it tells you it was probably Vince McMahon who made the call undertaker who had to agree. Lesnar, who had to know in advance, and Paul Heyman. I would presume Stephanie and Triple H knew, but it ended with that. None of the agents knew. The actual script for the show that day did not have a finish listed, but for this show, that wasn't unusual, nor was it in a match like that, so there were no red flags. Still, two major betting sites had a late shift on money on Lesnar, so much that went from a ridiculous 50 to 1 underdog to an actual favorite. As noted last week, McMahon had decreed the undertaker would not get touched during the buildup, but the build of this match was weak and the go home show Lesnar did leave undertaker laying with an F five. So a lot of people assume that this is sort of paint by numbers booking that if the, one of the guys is left laying on the go home show, then he's definitely winning. And I know that that's not always the case, but that is sort of common practice, right? Not anymore. I think that that was usually what you did to build up. And that was just kind of the old fashioned way of building anything up is that you leave the baby face down if he's winning the big match and or vice versa. So it's, but that's changed an awful lot, especially in the last 10 years. And to get people like Meltzer to predict, well, this is what's going to happen based on the way that it's booked. And you get people in those habits where they think that they can figure it out and you you try to change it up. Just when you think you got all the answers will change the questions. Melissa would write that Mark Calloway is a 49 year old man whose body has turned on him more than a decade ago, but he had his nights like WrestleMania in the last several years where he just denied the pain and became the undertaker. And this is a great line from Meltzer. I can recall having dinner with one of the WWE's biggest names telling me how badly Calloway was hurting and that he probably only had a year or two left. That was in the early fall of 1997. People were remarking back then how bad he was hurting. And here we are all this time later, Bruce, 
and he's still going. I mean, it's, it's really impressive. And Meltzer writes, I had always figured it was given that the undertaker would go into battle one last time when, but this time nearly die in the process. Uh, of course, Lance storm wrote a piece after this. And the gist of that was the undertaker is, is really confronting himself about how much longer can I do this? And he sort of imagines like everyone did. And you probably agree with this, that the streak ends when it's time for the undertaker to retire. I mean, that's sort of the, the tradition in wrestling you lose on your way out. So when you saw that the undertaker was going to lose here, did you just naturally assume or jump to the conclusion? Well, that means he's probably going to hang him up. Yeah, I thought so. But again, I've, I've, I had heard that for so many years prior that that was the last one. This is the last one. That was the last one. So I tend to take that with a grain of salt Let me and you, you don't, you don't give it a whole lot of thought. One person close to the situation said McMahon talked to undertaker into doing it. Another who would also know described it as McMahon making the call an undertaker agreeing and that he wasn't talked into doing something he didn't want to do. It was not his original call, but he was going to go in on it and never protested. And perhaps like he thought in late 2010, if he was going to lose, maybe he thought this was the guy of all the guys to lose to. This is probably the right one, right? I mean, even this earlier this year, Heyman made a couple of live shows and speaking tours where he said, no, the uh, WrestleMania 30 win was a shoot. He beat him for real. I mean, if he, you know, if he went into business for himself and, and beat him, who, who's going to stop him? Nobody can stop my, my beast incarnate, blah, blah, blah. Okay. But because he had the air of believability, this is, this is a suitable guy to beat him, right? Sure. It is. It's the right guy to beat him. Meltzer would say that, um, at some point in the match, Mark Calloway suffered a severe concussion. The match wasn't very heated and it was way worse when he went blank and was having to be led through. Nobody knows the exact spot because when it was over, Callaway didn't remember or have memory of most of the match. He did know enough to not kick out at the key time. And at first, even the announcers didn't know what to do. The graphic wasn't ready right away, nor was the music ready. And that delay made the fans think it was a mistake. The announcers were then given the cue by McMahon to talk about him as if this legendary gunfighters last fight and talk like we'd seen the undertaker for the last time, the spot where he got hurt may have been when Lesnar used a high single leg takedown just outside the ring. An undertaker fell backwards on the floor, hitting the back of his head, but that's just speculation. The only thing for sure is it happened. Now that's all directly from the observer. I've talked to undertaker about that match. Have you talked to me about this one? A little bit. Does, does he tell you the moment when the lights went out? I don't think he knows. I still, you know, he, there's a lot of speculation. He, he just think he knows he got knocked out. What he told, um, a friend of ours in my presence was, uh, I, the last thing I remember is seeing both of my feet over my head and thinking this ain't good. <laughs> and when he yeah. made, of course, we know that, um, what happened after he comes back through the curtain, and this is pretty incredible. When you think about this, he comes back through the curtain after this huge match, he's been knocked unconscious and a huge ovation for two decades of entertainment. And as soon as he walks through the curtain, he collapses and he's legitimately hurt. And Vince McMahon, even though we're in the middle of the biggest show of the year and arguably the most important of all time, because this is the first one on the network, he leaves, he just leaves because as McMahon, uh, or as, um, undertaker goes off to the hospital in an ambulance, McMahon jumps in with him. You, you, you've never heard of a story like this before where McMahon sort of abandons post. This is a reflection of him, the person, and also what he meant to Vince and, and the company, right? Yeah. And, and again, it was, it was undertaker and it's not just a performer. It's also his friend and, and one of the most extraordinary guys ever, ever to be in the company. So uh, again, knowing Vince McMahon, that, that doesn't shock me a bit. That's who he is. And that's what he would do. 
it's, uh, it's amazing to me when you think about just how important that must be, you know, for him to leave. I mean, this is the biggest thing ever. And I know that there's a lot of homers who are listening to this, who are not going to, um, like this analogy, but I remember as a kid, like whenever a, a football player on Alabama's football team would be injured, you know, the trainers come out and attend to him, whatever. But when I'm watching like old games and Joe Namath got hurt, bear Bryant would come on the field to check on him. Like that's sure. because he's the franchise and that's what, yeah. that's what the undertaker was. But not just that, this is a guy who had been, you know, sort of the backbone of the company for 23 years at this point. And we're going to go ahead and fire up the match. Then we'll talk about the match and then we'll, um, talk about the streak a little bit. Give everybody that time cue again. We'll count it down and we'll get going. Two hours, 15 minutes, and 57 seconds. All right. And we're going to press play at the end of three. One, two, three, play. What do you think of this incredible WrestleMania set here? Nolans. Uh, man, <laughs> you know, they just seem to get bigger and more grandiose each and every year. And Brock Lesnar making the entrance and uh, still haven't seen him yet, but... I know his music's playing because I see his picture up there. But you just take this. This is funny. Kevin Sullivan, uh, the devil. Kevin Sullivan asked me this question the other day. He says, Bruce, let me ask you. If you saw Brock Lesnar on one side of the street and Kevin Owens on the other side of the street. And you know you got to fight one of them. Which one are you going to? <laughs> he says, fuck Brock Lesnar. I'm not going near him. He's a monster. I mean, Brock is the ultimate just fighting machine. And you take a look at him. He looks like a badass. He is a badass. Mick Foley always tells the story. He says, you know why people think that Brock Lesnar doesn't like anybody and that he's mean and he likes to inflict pain? Because he doesn't like anyone and he loves to inflict pain. So that's just who he is, is a human being. That's that's who he really is. You know, he he had his own plane because he didn't like going to airports. Who who, so, who fucking likes going to airports? Okay, but I'm not going to go buy my own plane. Well, I mean, if you had that Brock Lesnar money, you might. He really didn't have Brock Lesnar money at the time, but he had enough that it was worth it to him to get a plane and not go through airports. This is a, uh, a special match for me. I don't know that mean you've ever talked about this. This is my first WrestleMania I ever went to. Well, hell, how was it? It was great, man. i had been a wrestling fan for, I don't know, 22 years. And this is my first one I had, you know, sort of gotten in and out of wrestling over the years. How about in the front row right there? We see, man, I forget that guy's name and he follows me on Twitter and we DM and he's a nice guy, but. You know, the yes. kid, the, the bald kid with the glasses who just freaks the fuck out when, when the street goes down. Yes. And his picture is, is forever immortalized by Absolutely. God for the, what the hell just happened? Take a look at yeah. this man. You know, what's funny is I just, I just typed in undertaker street guy. Oh, there it is. His name is Ellis. I can't pronounce Ellis's last name. M B E H. Thanks for uh, listening to the show here, Ellis. Hopefully you're on Patron with us. Yeah, I, I'm from Alabama. I can't pronounce your last name, Ellis. Sorry about that. Yeah, this was, um, you know, I took a couple of super casual wrestling fans and here's a peek behind the curtain since we're on Patron. My very best wrestling friend my entire life is a guy named Clint. And Clint is from fucking Hershey, Pennsylvania. So you've heard us rib Clint. For over a hundred episodes, whenever Bruce breaks out a special impression, Bruce remind everybody what Clint from Hershey sounds like. Oh, uh, this is Clint. And I've loved wrestling my entire life. I believe that Brock Lesnar was not the man. If this were a shoot fight, the undertaker would have buried him in one of these very specially made caskets just for him. So this is kind of fun. The imagery that we get here, we get all these caskets of all the folks that he's beaten over the years. And they're showing little clips of every single win. Um, and there's some stinkers in there, but there's some, some big opponents as well. Live. One of these fucking things caught on fire. 
Um, Undertaker doesn't have a lot of a lot of good luck with pyro and fire, man. He's been caught on fire a couple of times. Isn't that a crazy thing to say about somebody at work? Oh, I got caught on fire today. What happens? Well, it's walking through the caskets and yeah, my, they, my they blew him cave. up on stage one time. He got, he caught on fire. And then uh, a couple of times when he used to do the pyro in the corners and have the big concussions, they blew up right in his face. Well, I mean, it's a good thing. He's already dead. Yeah, exactly. So I said, so anyway, Clint, yep. Clint from Hershey, uh, he was with me here and this was his first WrestleMania. And, you know, since I live in Huntsville, this wasn't that bad of a deal. So we went down and spent the whole week. Uh, I camped out and got a, a, a suite and, um, we all just hung out and it was awesome. And I invited two of my buddies, one of which is Cole Kubelik from, um, ESPN and the sec network and jocks in Birmingham. And the other is somebody we talk about here on the show all the time, Mr. Cassio kid. And this was our first WrestleMania experience. And when the pin happened, we all thought it was a fuck up. Like we're looking around like, okay, they got to restart the match. Cause that was not the plan. And then they showed the graphic and I'm like, boy, they had that ready awfully fast. And then they started playing the music and I was like, holy shit. I think, I think we just saw wrestling history and this match start or this night started with Hulk Hogan, the rock and stone cold in the ring at the exact same time. So it makes you, you know, I mean, this is just filled with big WrestleMania moments. And of course we're going to cap the night off with Daniel Bryan's historic. Yes, yes, yes. World title win. So big, big deal for wrestling. Huge deal. And, you know, you're looking at the undertaker's entrance right now, and this would be something a lot of times when we would think about the location for the next WrestleMania, and you would think about undertaker's entrance a lot of times before you'd even think about who his opponent was going to be. Yeah. That always disappointed me when y'all ran shows on the West coast, like a year after this you're in, um, San Jose and he's doing it in the fucking daytime. And that just sucks. Well, I wasn't there Conrad. Don't yell at me about it. Wasn't uh, y'all. Oh, okay. I, mean, I was fired at this time. WrestleMania I'm nine. watching this on my couch. I didn't even have enough money to go to the, to the damn thing. Okay. I love you for that. <laughs> I couldn't even afford to go to this one. Yeah, I wasn't rich bucket. like you. I didn't know you then. Hell. <laughs> we didn't have Patron. Yeah. That's pre Patron days. That's my nah, PP I was days. drinking that Ron Rico rum. That was about as close to Patron as I could get. I said, OPP, that other people's Patron, you know? So yeah, he's looking back here. And so, but here's the thing with this. They can't get this fucking fire out. Now they're, they're going to cut away in a minute, but they're wigging the fuck out with fire extinguishers in just a minute. And it's, it's a real mess. Well, shit happens, man. <laughs> it's like, you know, what the fuck? Well, I mean, here's the thing too. Like how many practice sessions of exploding caskets were they expected to do? I'm sure they did at least one or two. It's worth mentioning here. Even if you're a non wrestling fan, you've got to be so impressed with this. That was what, you know, Cole was really taken aback by cause Cole's like an old school Andre, the giant JYD wrestling fan, but this more modern stuff, eh, maybe not so much, but the entrance set and just this presentation it's something to see in real life, just to really get a grasp of the scope and scale. Yeah. The pomp and circumstance of WrestleMania really and truly is, and, I, and I've never been to a super bowl, so I can't compare that on a, on an even playing field. But to me, the spectacle of, of WrestleMania is, is second to none. And, and especially with the God, just everything they put into it now. I, I can't imagine, you know, the eight hour, 10 hour production it feels like today. But I know even back in the day when I was there, it was just such an incredible production that it was all inspiring. And to watch it on pay per view is, is just pretty damn cool as well. So, you know, we've been watching for 48 minutes. The match hasn't started yet. Uh, let's we got to get the time in. Yeah. I'm not mad at it. Let's run through. I do want to run you through some opponents and I want you to, um, well, we'll just run through the streak here. March of 91 in Los Angeles. He beat Jimmy Snuka four minutes and 20 seconds. Give me some word associations. Say, say things. A beginning. Indianapolis in nine, April of 92 over Jake Roberts in six minutes and 36 seconds. 
I wasn't there, but it was kind of the battle of the dark side. April of 93 undertaker and giant Gonzalez by DQ seven minutes, 33 seconds. I apologize. No 94. What's up with that? Taker was hurt. April of 95 undertaker over King Kong Bundy and Hartford six minutes, 36 seconds. Just like Jake, the snake exact same number of minutes and seconds. Yeah, that's exactly what we wanted to do. So let's go back and recreate the Jake. Sorry. Um, I, I owe everyone and, and take an apology on that one too. Um, Anaheim March of 96 over diesel 16 minutes, 46 seconds. Now we're back on track. And, uh, the, you know, in a lot of ways that that was the battle of our big men at that time. Here's the big one. March of 97 in Chicago over Sid in 21, 29 to win the WWF title. Thought it was time. He was the man. We were going to make him the man in front of the camera too. I will right, we'll do one more before we take a break here. Boston, March 98 over Kane, 16 minutes, 58 seconds. The beginning of a wonderful, uh, story. We can do one more April of Oh one in Houston over triple H 18 minutes, 17 seconds. Um, just again, solidifying that he was the man. That's uh nine wins here. We're almost halfway through the streak and the bell's about to ring. What do you make of the undertaker's, uh, new Mohawk Chuck Liddell style haircut here? Well, I, I had talked to him, uh, beforehand, you know, and he, he, it's funny when he goes back and forth with the hair and he just hated the long hair for so long and he wanted to get get all the hair off. And that was something even going back to the triple H match, you know, where they, he had cut his hair thinking that he was done. And then Vince got him to come back in the wig and cut his hair off to, to do that shit. But it was a different look, you know, you know, again, it's reinventing himself and creating a new and different persona. I hate, I hate the damn, uh, the fake bake and the orange tan on him. What is fake bake? Fake bake is, uh, the fake tanning spray that bodybuilders use and stuff like that. That was the name of it. Fake bake. What about uh, undertaker's mas- oh. uh, mascara? Who puts undertaker's mascara on for him? He does. He does his own. Good God, man. He's a man. Okay. Thank you for that. <laughs> How about the, uh, the clothesline where he just lands on his feet from the outside of the ring. That's awesome to me. Well, he's a big enough bastard that he can do that. And that was something that. Vince always wanted to protect. And the only guy that did it was undertaker for a long time. And then guys just did it as high spots and shit, but that was the undertaker deal. And you know, it's, it's interesting. You talked about how Meltzer said this match was a dud. It wasn't good. Man, this was a physical fucking match and it was believable. And not all of them are going to be, you know, these, uh, friggin new Japan, Spot monkey face. Oh my god! It's two big guys. It's two big guys beating the shit out of each other and telling a different story. You know, a battle and a brawl. Why do you have to shit on New Japan and call everything Spot Monkey? Well, because that's what he thinks is the greatest shit. No, that's not true. It is true. No, it's not. This is a guy who used to rate, you know, Shawn Michaels and Undertaker five star matches. Because of when they were doing a lot of the spots and look, fuck, I'm not going to get into that argument over that douchebag here on Patreon. Well, don't Vote say from Patreon. Don't, 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 you're just going to have fun <laughs> with this now. Well, no, you're going to bring up his, his ratings on matches. I'm going to comment on them. No, but you said, and spot these guys beating the shit out of them. It, well, you, you just, it's amazing to me. You just look for reasons to piss people off your heel. I am a heel. You're right. But that, you know, it's a physical match and it's a different style. And again, you know, take her being older. Um, he's not going to have that same face fast paced match. You know, it's, it's a whole different style. He's in there with a the brawler. He's in there with the UFC guy and it's, it's going to be different. So it's, it's one thing, you know, when you talk about all oh, this UFC match was a great match when they lay on the damn ground in a, a Cobra Kai. Here you are fancying yourself a karate man and you're saying oh, yeah. they're laying on the ground in a Cobra Kai. That's a devastating old, that old Cobra Kai. 
what do you make of uh Brock driving the shoulder in? I don't know that I'd want to take one of those. <laughs> you know what? There's not a whole there's not a whole lot I would want to take from Brock, but if you're in there with him, it's not like you got a whole lot of choice. Yeah, it was one if he of, wants to do something to you, he's gonna do it. It's not a it's not a fun thing to joke about at all, but ten years ago I saw Joe Rogan in Las Vegas and he was putting over Brock because Brock was fighting in the UFC at the time. And he's like, this motherfucker is from another time. I mean, this son of a bitch used to, you know, be on a Clydesdale with like one of those hundred pound swords that he's just swinging around with one fucking hand and people start laughing. He's like, no, I'm not kidding. When you're around this guy, you realize even as a man, you're like rape is an option. Yes. And, and, <laughs> yeah. And so people just get quiet and look at him. He's like, no, I'm just saying it's not up to you. Like whatever he wants to do, it's happening and you can't stop it. And, and big sh- yeah, big show was, was like that saying here's a seven foot guy, 400 pounds. That was afraid of Brock. Yeah. Like if he wants to, if he wants to rip your head off and shit down your neck, he will. You know why? Cause he can Exactly. Yeah, he's he's a different animal and a different breed, man. It's scary shit. It's um it's another level for sure. But there is a lot of or so it would seem mutual respect between Undertaker and Brock Lesnar. In your experience, what was uh Brock's relationship like with Undertaker? Uh, it was always good. And there was a lot of respect because both guys were athletes. Um, you know, tough guys for the most part, respect one another. And there doesn't, there isn't a whole lot that has to be said. And they respect, they had, they had mutual respect for one another. Mark is quiet guy. He's not going to tell you how tough he is or how bad he is. He'll show you. And it's, he's going to carry himself in a way that, commands respect and Brock is pretty much the same damn way. So these guys, they did have that mutual respect because they both were tough guys that could do just about anything and stand toe to toe with the best of them. You think these guys were ever drinking buddies? Of course we know famously that, um, undertaker was not scared to uh, drink a little Jack Daniels every now and again. Yeah, they definitely were. And, and again, it helps, it helps that they liked one another, um, as much as Brock can like anybody, no, but Brock did like him. And, and, and as I said, they, ow, and that was the spot where a lot of people believe undertaker had his bell wrong. He whacked the shit out of his head, a severe concussion and supposedly nobody's home right now. See if we notice a difference here in the match, watching it back. Damn. Well, if, if that wasn't the spot, <laughs> it certainly contributed to it. Cause man, that shit just looked absolutely brutal. And you know, you, you go through and, and watch a lot of this stuff and, and you go through and watch the, the F fives that come afterwards and, and the suplexes and stuff. Um, if that one was just something that kind of rung his bell a little bit, the rest of that stuff is probably what, what jarred the rest of it and made it go bye-bye. Right. I am the just wondering here. God, you know, the mustard tastes much better than it did hmm, on my skin. Anyway, Paul Heyman digress. But yeah, that's just being, you know, pretty much manhandled right there. You're coming whether you want to or not. He's still a little aware. All right. Let me, he's selling his ass off. No, he's still in it at this point. Uh, I mean, he, no, he's, he's still in it at this point. I, I, I don't know that he's, he's out of it here. He's crumbling. He's calling he's spots. It legit. Huh? Well, we don't know that he's calling spots. We know he's talking. I know he's calling spots. Okay. 
No, he's he's aware at this point, but uh God damn that was snug on the outside. Shit. But that's what you do when you get in there with Brock Lesnar, man. Give everybody a time cue so they know they're up with you. Um, where the hell are we? Right now we're at uh two thirty five ten with Brock just working on that damn leg and good God. So after uh, Hunter in Houston, he'd go in March of 02 to Toronto and beat Ric Flair in a street fight, 18 minutes and 47 seconds. Your thoughts? Uh, my opinion, two legends beating the fuck out of each other. That was some great shit. And I think that's where Rick got a lot of his confidence back. The next year falls off a cliff. He gets a win over big show and a train in Seattle in nine minutes and 45 seconds. Beating two men by God. Cause one couldn't contain him. The next that was year, shit. MSG in 04, he beats Kane, seven minutes, 45 seconds. The return of the dead man. Man, big bump into the barricade there. When you know he's hurting, has to hurt even more. There's a fucking Brock Lesnar guy. Hey, uh, chat me up. Remind everybody about the surgery that the Undertaker had in the last year or so. Uh, he got us, he got new hips in the last year or so. So, um, you know, Obviously saw him against, against John Cena and what have you. And, uh, Rusev later on, but he's, he's moving better than, than I've seen him move in a long time. And it's, I always tell him, I've said here many times, he, he could go to the ring until he's 70 years old on go out on a walker and the people will still be happy to see him. Now, when Brock starts these damn suplexes here to me, I think this is probably where it really just started taking its toll. You know, it's one thing to be taking your own bumps and it's another thing to be thrown by another man and be hammered into the mat the way that he is. Yeah. As he gets going here, uh, in 05, Undertaker beat Randy Orton in 14, 14. I think that that was, that was something just bringing Randy, you know, Randy was one of the first guys where we ever even discussed ending the streak. Really? So Randy could have almost been the guy in 05. Yeah. Yeah. Chicago. He beat uh, Mark Henry in a casket match, nine minutes, 26 seconds. Mark was discussed to to take the streak too, for about 30 seconds. The next year in Detroit, no seven, he beat Batista to win the world title. Uh, rising up again, man. It was just, you, you can't kill off that character. In 08, he won the world title again, this time from edge. These guys go a long time, 23 minutes, 50 seconds. And that, that was somebody that, you know, undertaker really loved working with. And it was undertaker beating him was a way to get edge over. Um, next up, we've got the match. Everybody talks about Houston, April of 09. Shawn Michaels, 30 minutes, 41 seconds. My opinion, his best WrestleMania match. No doubt about it. Let's see what Brock's got in store for Undertaker here. A little DDT action. Uh, next up, we've got uh, another rematch. This time in Glendale, Arizona, March of 2010 with Shawn Michaels, 23 minutes, 59 seconds. I thought it was great, but it wasn't as good as the first one. I agree. The next year in Atlanta in 11, uh, he beat triple H in a no holds barred match, 29 minutes, 22 seconds. I thought that the match was good, but at this point I, I was looking for, I don't, I don't know. I, I just didn't think it needed to be a no holds barred match. A third match at WrestleMania against triple H happens in April of 12. This time in the hell in a cell, Shawn Michaels is the special guest referee, 30 minutes, 52 seconds. Same thing. I, I just didn't, I didn't think that it needed to be, be the hell in the cell. I didn't think they needed the gimmick to me. Undertaker's streak in WrestleMania was big enough. Triple H has, um, Undertaker's gloves and hand wraps and Shawn Michaels referee shirt with a framed picture of all three of them at the top of the ramp framed together in his office. And it says the end of an era. Um, April of 13 in New Jersey, undertaker CM punk, 22 minutes, seven seconds. Um, I enjoyed the hell out of it. Cause I liked the story. I liked this, you know, uh, as much as I was sad about the, the passing of my friend, Bill Moody, Paul bear, um, their incorporation. I know that 
that uh, Paul Bear would have loved that. This is what uh, Meltzer wrote of the match. Lesnar pinned Undertaker in 25 minutes and 10 seconds to end the streak. Lesnar looked gigantic, and I don't know what he weighed, but he looked 310. Undertaker looked orange with the fake tan, and this was a slow moving match that had very little heat. They did a spot where Lesnar got out of the choke slam and Undertaker out of the F5. Lesnar single legged Undertaker on the floor, and Undertaker fell over in what may have been the injury spot. The announcers called Paul Heyman the greatest manager of all time. They aren't wrong in considering him in that category particularly when you factor in the last two years, but he's made it clear. He's not a manager. He's an advocate undertaker did snake eyes and a high kick followed by a leg drop for a near fall, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Lesnar did two sloppy German suplexes, but undertaker came back with the last rod out of the corner. Undertaker hits the tombstone pile driver and people react to that. But Lesnar kicks out. He goes for a second tombstone. Lesnar reverses and from the tombstone position, power bombs, or powered undertaker to his shoulders and hit a third F five for the three count quote. Everyone was shocked. Eventually when people realized what happened, there was an undertaker chant, but it was not as loud as you would have expected. Undertaker milked the crowd for a reaction, which was there, but nothing close to what you would have expected. The announcers then pushed the idea that he was going out for the final time, like a sense of finality star and a half. Your response. Yeah, I disagree. I, you know, it, it was a story of two gladiators and they're beating the shit out of each other and trying to win and nothing was working and, and they beat the hell out of each other and it was a battle. So yeah, I strongly disagree with it. You know, it's ice cream. Some people like chocolate. Some people like vanilla, right? Some people like strawberry. But now I think, you know, even, you know, in the match, I just think that the, the bumps and everything else, you know, Taker hadn't, hadn't been on the road steady at this time and hadn't been working night in and night out and wasn't, you know, in the best ring shape here, but, uh, you know, he's got Lesnar. What the hell is this damn thing called? Is this the Cobra Kai? Listen to you. What? It's a fucking triangle choke. Okay. Well, actually, well, that was like uh, a dragon sleeper, wasn't it? It's a Google plotter. A Google plotter? Yeah, we'll go <laughs> a Google plotter. <laughs> well, I don't even think they had Google back then. It, it's no. G O G O P L A T A. Google plotter is, right. is the technical Brazilian jiu jitsu term for it. But yeah, there's probably some sort of. It's a fucking double underhook dragon screw sleeper reverse reverse schnavitz. Or what do you call uh, it? Fernum Schnavitz. Fernum Schnavitz, my bad. That's your paces. That's pay the K. Chase. 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 We could do I could do a whole goddamn just show with that. You do. Every oh, week. Okay. Well, you know. Just saying. But I think, you know, even here right now in the shoot world, it's the guys have beaten the shit out of each other, the shoot shoot world in a shoot world. Yes. They have beaten the living shit out of each other. It's just fun. And the shoot world. Well, is is in not in the unshoot world, right? See in the unshoot world, he's dead. Well, yeah. And see, now he's got him in the Google suplex again, the Google suplex, the Google, the Google plex. Isn't that what you call it? Is it a Google plex? Undertaker has a name for it. It's like something gate. Hell's gate. There you go. Yeah. Oh, well then that's the official name If Undertaker named it. Hell's gate. Then by God it's hell's gate. It's not the Google plata. No, it ain't no Google. Now. Okay. Watch this bump here. Bam. I would say that one probably even took more out of him than the one on the outside of the ring. Yeah. He looks sleep. That shit hurts. And <laughs> Heyman knows it. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like, hey, Oh my God. Can I see a replay here, sir? And bam. Cause there's just nowhere to go. There's it's, it's all on his back in his head and that freaking hurts. Did JR get a call this match or is this Michael Cole? 
Hang on, I'm gonna listen. I'm gonna turn up my volume. Folks, don't do this at home. Nobody's saying anything. And now Undertaker, Quala, Michael Cole. All right. Why did you think it was Jim Ross? Well, because Jim Ross, you know, he likes to call them big matches. Now he had just gotten fired for drinking with flair. Oh, no shit. Yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't, I didn't know that. Okay. Now folks, let me ex- explain to you this, uh, here, key lock gimmick that Brock Lesnar has on undertaker right now. You mean a Kimura? Well, I, it's a key lock Kimura gimmick, but it fucking hurts. Oh, really? Yes, it really. I, I, I ain't kidding you there. And when Brock puts it on you, it fucking hurts. And Undertaker putting it on Brock probably hurts too. Not nearly as much as the way that Brock had it hooked, though. I don't know why, but you explaining now, folks. This hold hurts. Well, I'm trying to provide color commentary here and explain to you that the pain. Therefore is in the arm where undertaker has it locked, therefore causing pain to shoot up into his arm piece that goes in to the nerve receptacles to his brain that say, ouch. So I was never good color guy. You know, the first time I ever did color commentary, I replaced Michael Hayes and the free birds were in the ring. And I remember saying to Jim Ross, well, Jim, we're cooking with gasoline now. And that was the last time I did color commentary <laughs> for a long time. Yeah, I sucked. But here, man, I, I think Taker's uh, probably out of it a little bit and uh, just going on instinct and just kind of feeling it. He knows that he's in a fight, and by God, he's actually in a fight with that fucking monster there. Um and just going on instinct, but he's still got, you know, shit. He's still got his wits about him to just get his leg up and do shit. I bet he wish he had some water right now. And if he was rock and like, he could just roll out of the ring and put the commentary headset on and grab a bottle of water right now, but he's got the presence of mind to go up and do a little old school here. Little wobbly. <laughs> Dude, that's co- That's what we call cock strong right there. That's 320 pounds falling on you. And then to be able to pick it up and F5 it. That's a strong motherfucker. I would like to go back to the hotel now. Watch this. Off the top rope. Bam. If I was in Brock's position, I would have hit long before Undertaker did. <laughs> My knees just would have buckled. Fuck this shit. But you know, a lot of scuttlebutt, a lot, a lot of stuff going back and forth. Who knew what, when, everything else. Um, again, I don't know, folks. So this ain't the gospel. This isn't one of those Bruce knows and everything else. I, I've been told by a couple of different people. Um, you know, the only people that knew were Vince, Brock, Taker, and Heyman. And that was it. A friend of ours who's an agent didn't know and found out when everybody else did and was not happy about it. None of the agents knew. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and I, I would imagine, and I don't even know that, that, uh, well, I would imagine Kevin Dunn probably knew too. This match and, but, um, the triple that H shit right there hurt. Yeah. This match and the Triple H match, uh, both went long. So as a result, uh, one of the ladies matches was cut. Well, it happens. It definitely happens, but man, it it just was, you know, I I think that those Germans there probably did, you know, as much damage, if not more than, than a lot of that other stuff earlier on in the night, because that shit's just brutal. Fuck. Last people I would want to take a German suplex from are uh, Brock Lesnar and Dr. Death Steve Williams. What about Swoggle? Would you take one from him? Hell no, man, because he does them Austrian suplexes. What do you mean Austrian suplexes? Well, it, it's Austria is a little smaller than Germany, and so he learned his in Austria versus Germany. Listen to you. 
What? He's a little feller. He called me last, that little bastard called me last night at 1230 at night to cuss me out for you calling him. You left the, the message, other night. not me. I don't recall that. By the Kinda way. I'm like Undertaker doesn't recall <laughs> this match right here. <laughs> yes. I don't recall the other night. So there. I feel like we should also mention that, um. I have the, the voicemail he left me posted on Patron. Have you heard that? I heard it the next day. Well, I, I posted it. I bleeped a couple of words out, but I posted it. He's got a foul mouth. Oh, he, that's awful. I mean, for a he foul, he foul mouthed me last night at 1230. He called me, but I couldn't answer. What the hell were you doing? Can't say. Oh, hell. Old time. Okay. Well, that's a good thing. I, didn't figure I told him it was all your fault. Oh, did you really? Of course I did. Well, that doesn't surprise me. But you can see right here, man, uh, you know, uh, everything he's got to do this tombstone and people think this is it. This has got to be it. It's a tombstone. One, two, three. He's got, oh no. What's it going to take? Um, no, you're exactly right. That's what everybody thought. Even Heyman, Heyman thought that was finished. That's what they told him. It must be something else. Brock has now gone into business for himself. He will not be denied. He will not be denied. I still think one of your fa- one of my favorite things you ever did on the show is when you were talking about how <laughs> I can't believe this is real. You were talking about how Heyman doesn't use towels in hotels. No, he uses towels. He just doesn't get clean towels. No, yeah. Yeah. That's what I mean. I'm sorry. I'm just saying like, he doesn't, <laughs> they don't want anybody to clean his room. Right. And, well, can we, can we bring towels? And you immediately jump to something that I was like, I've never heard that before, but it's the funniest thing ever. Do you remember? No. What? I will air dry. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I yeah, will that was air dry whore. I don't know why, but. I will air dry whore. Oh my God. Tickle. Did we just miss the finish? No, we didn't. We missed the finish on air dry whore folks. We're talking about Paul Hammond and air drying and Brock Lesnar just beat the undertaker. One, two, three. Look at the shock. We were shocked. We were talking about Paul Heyman air drying whore. What, look at the, look at the, the fans, like the reactions in the crowd. Nobody can believe what we've seen. Like this has become the most predictable thing. I mean, this would almost be like Alabama losing in the championship game. It just doesn't happen. And they're looking away for something else to hit. Yeah. Someone's got to run in something. Somebody's got to come down and change something. There's got to be something overturn it. And by the way, Brock and, and Paul Heyman traded on this win for years. My client is the one in the 21 and one eat, sleep, beat the streak, repeat. I mean, he had that ramble, that pitch every single night for years. And it was all based on this. Yeah. Because it was what a shot. I remember looking to my left. Uh, and I'm across the ring from where this is. I'm to their left. I'm to Heyman's left right now. And, uh, I looked up to the left, like thinking I'm going to see something on the screen. And sure enough, when they showed that 21 and one with the lightning behind it, it's like, oh my God, look at this guy. No one can believe it. They're crying. Well, because he is, he is like wrestling royalty, the most beloved and Brock Lesnar is this mercenary for hire here. Who's here to wrestle for money and hold Vince McMahon up and threaten to go to the UFC. And then the little wink, what an asshole. If he's, if he's listening right now, I I didn't mean that. I'm kidding. Yes, you did. You say that about him all the time off the air. They don't even have that. They don't even what? have internet in Canada. It's fine. 
Is he in Canada? Yeah, he lives in the woods in Canada. Because he can. Still uses a flip phone. What's wrong with that? Nothing. Okay. So I'm saying. And that you know, the even still, you know, we're three whatever minutes from the finish. Taker's just laying in the ring, and this audience is still in absolute disbelief. What a like, shot. What a shot that is, man. People are, people are thinking, how could they even have, tw- how could they even make 21 in one is a graphic? Yeah. There he is folks. Is That's it, the man to see, beat the street. Serious business. This is the, uh, and this is probably my best live experience besides one night stand. Oh five. I mean, this is one of the most important moments in wrestling history right here. This is probably even with all that Heyman has accomplished. This is a top five all time moment for him, right? Oh, probably. This is probably the big, that was probably the biggest moment in his career. Without a doubt that many people that streak, that man, uh, both, you know, everybody involved in it. I think that was probably the biggest moment in his career for all those guys. And, you know, Talking to Undertaker afterwards, just, you know, him sitting there thinking it's, I just want to get up and, and get out of the ring on my own. Cause he's hurting bad. He is hurting bad and, and it's over now. You know, the match is over. Um, I got through it, but boy, I feel it. So it, it was, yeah, he was a hurting puppy. And right about the and right about this time as I'm sending my annual text to him and telling him great job, hated the finish, love you, let me know you're okay. And uh, didn't didn't hear back from him until the next day. Well, he but had other shit going on. I'm sure they gave him his phone, Conrad. <laughs> Why didn't he return my text? Why didn't Damn he it? return my text? Yes. I brought him into this goddamn company and he can't return my text. I'm in yeah. the hospital. That's all he had to say, man. What? I'm in the hospital. Oh. Yeah. Oh, what if I'm just, now you're being a smart ass. I'll say, yeah, I thought you saying. were saying the next day he was just like hospital, but no, you mean that's all he had to say. It wouldn't have been that yeah. hard. Your fingers weren't it's, broken. Just your brain yeah. and your hips and your back and your neck and your arms. But your fingers were fine. God damn it. It's me. <laughs> that is the most bruised thing ever. Yeah. Listen, I understand that nobody's allowed in here, but it's me. I'm I've, special. I've actually said that before. No, so, I know. And by, by the way, it works. How about here on Patron? Biggest moment in WWE history, maybe in the last five years, top five, probably ever typical me and you miss the finish. Cause we're laughing about Paul Heyman. I will air dry. <laughs> <whore>. <laughs> uh, and that's definitely in the top five of the Patron bonus shows. Yeah. Top five. Yeah, definitely top five. So. There you go. Yeah. And the other thing about the, the, Hay- the whole Heyman, uh, everybody of course, giving him a standing ovation because he deserves it. And look at Lawler's hair here from when we were looking at stuff and what was it, uh, back in 1999 <laughs> anyway. Um, uh, but the other thing about Paul Heyman's hotel room was the, the flex of like underarm deodorant, white flakes all over the room too. It was interesting. Just had to throw that in. And one asshole holding up a buzz sign. So if you're listening to this on Padron, you're an asshole. Because everybody else is standing and showing respect for the most part. It's 6.52 p.m. New Orleans time. And I'm pretty sure Taker's just sitting here right now. He's milking it all in saying, please, legs, move. (laughs) Please foot, just go right in front of the other ones, man. And that folks is just sheer adrenaline and, and just willpower right there for him to be standing and 
and not collapse in there. Cause he got him some cotton mouth working and every single fiber in his body is in pain. Ah. Uh. It's it's yeah, crazy I, to think about this is uh I mean I thought this was it. I thought that was definitely the end. I think a lot of people had that natural conclusion. And you hear, you know, you see this long, lonely walk here, and after he took his sweet time getting out of the ring, you know now he's got a concussion, but you didn't maybe know that at the time. You assume, oh well this is it. But hell we assume that in Orlando when he left the hat in the jacket in the ring and didn't happen there either, but then you read online that he was rushed to the hospital and that Vince McMahon left WrestleMania and wasn't there for the main event of WrestleMania because he was checking on the undertaker. I think at that point, everybody thought, man, we've just squeezed all we can out of him. And he used to tell a story about riding with Vince McMahon, where he would just pick you to death about asking questions. And what about this? And what about that? And just constantly working on business. And when you were exhausted and passing out and can barely function and he drops you off at your house before you get out. He says, did, did I, get, I a- get it all? I mean, this, at this point feels like he got it all with the undertaker. Does it not? Yeah, he did. And, uh, and he still got some more after this. So, you know, that was, um, just it, to me, it was an incredible match because it, it told a great story of just two gladiators getting in there and fighting their hearts out. And, it was, it was what it was, man. And you saw history in the making with the street coming to an end. Had it been me, I'll go ahead and answer the, all the questions. Um, I would not have ended the streak. Didn't like it. Uh, after the fact, you let it sink in for a while. I loved the finish and I loved the, uh, it being Brock, but if it was up to me, wouldn't have done it. Um, the questions that we're talking about, of course, are the questions here on Patron. David wants to know, does Bruce think the taker was okay with losing like this? Yes. I, yes, he was. Uh, Roberto says, I heard there were talks about undertaker wanting Kurt angle to break the streak in Oh five Oh six. Is that true? Or just rumor and innuendo? That's rumor and innuendo. Uh, Oh five Oh six. You know, like I said, we talked about Randy Orton at one time, but, um, then it was, we kind of were on a roll of keeping that streak alive. Elliot writes, Paul Heyman once gave a speech and when he kind of hinted that Brock Lesnar calls the streak to end by F fiving the undertaker so hard that he wouldn't kick out for real being that he was hospitalized and no music played. And even the announcers were waiting for clearance to continue with the streak ending. Could this be true or just Paul putting on more than what it was? I would edge on the side of Paul putting on more than it was. <laughs> okay. A hundred percent that, but good for Paul. You know, uh, oh, re- Hey, look, man, Paul Heyman has turned this into a business. A, fucking a, why not? Yeah. I mean, we did fuck. Yes. I mean, that's, what, that's the first thing they wanted to talk about. Uh, a wrestling historian writes who was strongly considered to end the streak over the years before it actually happened. You freestyled that it was Randy Orton. And then for a hiccup, Mark Henry, uh, who else? Um, seriously, there weren't, you know, there wasn't anybody seriously considered after that Randy, because Randy was young and we were looking for, for that to be the point to really kick off Randy's career and, and give him that to be able to brag about, um, at, at a young age, we felt he had it. We felt that it would really, really help him and catapult him to, to mega stardom. Um, you know, we seen his name was mentioned from time to time, but really after Mark Henry, man, we stopped talking about people taking the streak. We, we always made it a part of the story, but I don't think we ever really seriously considered anybody else ever doing it. Um, Bruce wants to know, or Tim wants to know, Bruce, who should have ended the streak? I think they got the right guy. And, and, and other than that, if it wasn't Brock, I, I would have given it to Randy Orton. 
Jason wants to know, has Bruce seen the Paul Heyman promo talking about the ending of the streak? He puts all kinds of shades of gray on it. Yeah, I, I, I have, I've seen, I've seen something where Paul has talked about it and, and Paul and I have, have spoken about it one-on-one and, and it's, uh, and I've spoken to undertaker about it, but it's, you only know what, you know, I wasn't there. So Travis, I gotta take everybody one, else's word. Travis wants to know, do you think taker had planned this to be his final match? Taker was planning for it to be his final match all the way back in 06 and 07. Nick wants to know, hypothetically, if Jim Cornette was in creative and wrote the ending of the streak, who would have been chosen and what might the pitch to Vince sound like? God damn. If we bring bullet Bob back out of retirement, bullet Bob will unmask him and then he'll end the streak. I don't know. Simon wants to know WrestleMania 29, the prior year received lots of complaints about the event being too corporate and predictable. Do you think the streak the following year was maybe Vince's way of shaking things up? Well, I think the ending the streak and Daniel Bryan and everything else that they did at, at WrestleMania 30, I think that it all was about shaking things up and, and kind of making some noise as if, you know, we're listening to you. So yeah, it was. Okay, guys, check this out. I'm excited to tell you about a brand new book called the headlock of destiny. It's a pro wrestling and epic fantasy mashup. Think like Royal Rumble meets Game of Thrones. It's got a ton of kick-ass characters inspired by and almost in homage of the wrestlers of the golden era. You know, like Macho Man Randy Savage or Mr. Perfect, Million Dollar Man, Owen Hart, Big Boss Man, so many more. And the Headlock of Destiny imagines these titans wrestling in a fantasy world, beating on each other in front of roaring crowds. It's fast-paced, it's a unique tale, and the early reviewers are all raving about it. It follows the story of a beer drinking underdog, a Titan who gets dragged into the headlock of destiny tournament and ends up squaring off with some truly epic ass kickers. The book's got tons of cool Easter eggs thrown in. For example, the hero's first big fight takes place at an arena called the Scott hall. How fun is that? You're going to love this. Imagine if everything in the ring were 100% real and the fate of nations hung on the results. And then imagine if you know, golems and minotaurs and all kinds of crazy shit was climbing into the ring to face off with Titans inspired by like the undertaker or hacksaw, Jim Duggan. You don't have to be a fantasy nerd to love this one. It's just a ton of fun. It's available on Amazon today in paperback and ebook versions. Check it out. I'm telling you, you're going to be glad you did. It's headlock of destiny. You can find it right now on Amazon. And it's worth mentioning that the creators of this book, man, they're big wrestling fans, just like me and you. They listen to something to wrestle every single week. Uh, So if you like this show, you might dig this book. Go check it out on Amazon. I think you'll be glad you did. Headlock of Destiny. Two thumbs up. Something to wrestle. Hope you enjoyed hearing Bruce and I discuss WrestleMania 30, Undertaker, Brock Lesnar. Uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll try to do that long form and cover the whole WrestleMania 30 show at another point. But what a special night that was. Uh, one of our most requested topics is WrestleMania 17. And I didn't really particularly love that WrestleMania, uh, just because I didn't really like the finish. I know that sounds crazy, but I think in hindsight, most fans agree with that. It was the biggest WrestleMania ever. I remember exactly where I was when I watched it, but I don't know. It just, it felt weird seeing stone cold join Mr. McMahon. And I'm not sure the live crowd wanted it or was ready for it either way. Uh, it's a WrestleMania that's near and dear to Bruce's heart. It's right there in Houston. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and play a clip from our old Patreon. Uh, you can hear all of these bonus clips over at adfreeshows.com. But this one is about the main event of WrestleMania 17, Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Rock. Do a little watch along. Fire up your WWE network and, uh, and join us here for a little quarantine fun today. One, Bruce, this is uh, probably your favorite WrestleMania just because it was in your hometown, right? Well, it's my favorite WrestleMania because it was in my hometown because I participated in it. And the main event was something and the build up to this was probably one of the greatest builds for WrestleMania ever, uh, especially at that time. So it was a huge event sold out and just a tremendous atmosphere all the way around. 
Well, we're going to have fun watching this one. Fire up your WWE network, go to three hours, five minutes and 30 seconds. Again, it's WrestleMania 17, 2001. The time cue we're going to for the main event is three hours, five minutes and 30 seconds. That's three Oh five 30. And Bruce, uh, if you'll give us a countdown, we'll get going on this one, man. All right. When I say play, uh, hit your buttons there, folks. Here we go in three, two, one play. So you take a look at the beautiful Astrodome in Houston, Texas. Uh, a year later, this place would be completely closed and shut down for the foreseeable future. And not much else has ever happened in there since. So it was a big deal for the WWE and funny story about the, the WrestleMania, see the WrestleMania X seven, how you don't see them. That was a compromise because that shit actually went a lot higher, but it blocked an additional 20,000 seats. And they didn't find that out until the day before the event and had to have compromises to be able to get that thing in there. And stone cold, Steve Austin coming down to hometown crowd. And he's the challenger here. It's kind of interesting as well. Don't mess with Texas. Don't mess with stone cold. In the build up to this thing, man, we had bought a, uh, world champion steer for $660,000 at the Houston livestock show and rodeo leading up to this set a record there as well. So a lot of records being set here. Why'd y'all buy that 600 grand cow? It's a long story, but Mattress Mac, Jim McInvale, who was a sponsor, Gallery Furniture, um, helped us out with that. And one of the biggest things to do all year at the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo, the big prestige deal is when they auction off the Grand Champion Steer at the end of the rodeo. And we went ahead and bought that son of a bitch and had Steve Austin and Mattress Mac there to bid on it and pay damn near a million dollars for it. Well, a little over half million. Look at the flash bulbs everywhere. That's one thing I miss about wrestling. The, the good old days here, the flash bulbs are going off everywhere. It was, it was such a great atmosphere. And you know, the old days, you know how they did that. They had little like lights hanging from, from the rafters that you could barely see that would shoot off. So it wasn't actually flash bulbs. A lot of times in the olden days, it was just lights that we would flash, make them look like flash bulbs. Here are their flash bulbs. When were you doing, um, gimmicked flash bulbs? God from 19, probably from 1985 up until they may still hang them today. Well, I thought you said these were real. These are real. You can tell because of where they're coming from and you can't recreate that same thing in a dome like this. It's hard to do in an arena. It's much easier to do. And then you put the star filter on those cameras and it makes them look even better. So Bjorn Nelson, dude, it's your match, man. And Stone Cold's getting it off, starting this damn thing off nice and hot. Um, Well, they were ready for this shit, man. I'll tell you. The build up to this with the, um, the my way remake from Limp Biscuit. It's still the music video. I think a lot of wrestling fans talk about as being one of the best packages for a match ever. And there was such a great rivalry with Austin and rock that it, it made it all that much more. And people were not disappointed. Uh, you know, we just did the show where we talked about one of their first big matches, which was for the intercontinental title. And now several years later, the two biggest stars in the industry. Yeah. We we've covered WrestleMania 15 before, which is their first WrestleMania match. And this is their second. Uh, and I think we've covered their last one with 19 as well of the three 15, 17, 19, 
Odd years only, baby. What, which do you prefer? The first one. Really? Yeah. You know, th- this one was great, but for me, I hate, I, I didn't hate. Um, I just was not a big fan of the, of the Steve Austin turn here and Mr. McMahon. Nobody was just wasn't a big fan of it. And I knew that we had to get there somehow. I just felt it was out of nowhere too soon without, uh, enough meat behind it to get to the turn. There's a lot of meat behind it, a lot of story, but I just felt that it needed more time for the turn. It seems like we went, we went out into, (laughs) you know, Vince had this thing about going out into the crowd and not being able to go out there without a lot of security and people knowing and what have you. But we did, we did some stuff with undertaker and triple H at the fan fest where we went, we fought all the way through the fan fest through the crowd. And then of course we did crowd stuff here and it was always a cringing moment because you're always looking around and making sure and hoping that no one is going to get hurt or hit by a, an errant elbow or fist or kick or anything like that. Right. Back in the ring and by God, you know, the thing I loved about both of these guys matches, if you watch them, it's perpetual motion. Even when they're down selling, they're moving. Austin coming off and here he has his, his run forest run, uh, braces on both knees. Run forest run. Austin and rock by this time, by God, um, it, it was, it was really scary. The popularity here of these two. No matter where you went, no matter what you did, um, people knew them and were clamoring to them. Conrad, would you want to take one of those? No, I'm going to pass on, on anything inside the ring. I think I'm just going to stick to podcasting if that's okay. But if you had a dashiki on, would you give one of those? Okay. So you're not on taking in. Would you give one? Nope. Don't want to do anything in the ring. I'm, I'm a podcaster. Oh, hell. Tell you what though. I'll do it. If you take a uh, ultimate warrior, press slam, clothesline splash. I'd take it from anybody, but the ultimate warrior. No, I, and I've, I've already, and I've already taken all those. Yeah. We'll take them again. I've already done it. Well, you don't know what I've done. I do. Cause you told me you haven't done it. I uh, ask your mom what I've done. My mom is dead. Well, let's dig her up. Let's ask her. No, she's already cremated and spread out over the Pacific. Did Kane do that? No. Okay. No. I don't mean your Kane. I mean, that's gotta be Kane. No, it was Paul Bear. Oh, there you go. See, he's probably more qualified to do such. Well, you know, you know. I always kind of forget when I say Kane that you have a Kane too, that you're used to hearing Kane every day. Yeah, this is true. And then, uh, spending time with Kane recently, the big red machine Kane was probably threw you off a little, didn't it? It did. Yes, it did. You're not Kane. I got a Kane at the house. You're not Kane. Yeah. My Kane references these days are to a 19 year old smart ass. What's he up to these days besides being a smart ass? I'm just going to school and being a smart ass. Pretty much all a 19 year old, uh, going to college has to do. I love rock talking down Hebner and Hebner trips over the steps and falls. And then rock trips over the same (laughs) steps and falls. And here we go. The, the bell to the head looks like, uh, it was a distraction. You don't think rock's going to come up busted open. Do you? I don't know. That was a pretty serious shot. And there's the rocks mama right there. And his brother-in-law now manager. Oh, that's his brother-in-law. So that's, uh, that's Danny Garcia's brother. Yeah. That's cool. 
Yep. Head of Seven Bucks Productions. That would be the production company of The Rock. Oh, my God. He's been severely lacerated. Oh, man. Good God almighty. I hate when that happens. Well, it happens sometimes, man. Don't bust up that pretty face. Excuse me, sir. Please, I've got to get my notes. And my diet coat to preserve my beautiful figure. My good sir. By the way, I know that most everyone listening to this probably would say that raw, not raw, but Ross and Lawler are their favorite commentating duo. Can I just tell you, I really enjoyed Paul Heyman. I think Heyman Ross is underrated. I think that Paul Heyman challenged Ross a lot more than King ever did. Yeah. And I think that, you know, Heyman and Ross, they were a great team. They were a good team when they were in WCW. Yeah, I really dig it. Now, Austin turning it up. And, I, you know, I think that there was, you would be hard pressed to find one person in that audience that didn't think Austin was going to win on this night. Yeah. I mean, he's the hottest act there is. And those punches hurt by God, all of them. Uh, most of them. Yeah. Most of them. Steve threw good punches, but I think most people would say that they were, uh, they were right there. They landed. Who had the, Stone. Wor- who had the worst working punch? The idea being, um, Goddamn kid hit me with as hard as you can in the face. Your working punches are killing me. God, there were a bunch of them. Uh, warrior had warrior had terrible one. Um, there, there were some guys that would look at it. Like a lot of people would criticize rocks punch his spit punch because it, it was more of a slap than anything. And it wasn't really a punch. Um, uh, some guys would criticize Jake's punch. I thought Jake threw a great punch, but the guys that, that would hurt you with some of their stuff, Nikolai Volkov was like lead really when yeah yeah nikolai would nikolai would hit you vader his were brutal and pretty heavy um but during this era you know you had it was all about the attitude era it was all about laying that shit in that's that's what got steve over steve you couldn't see through his stuff and he would lay those punches and kicks in for the most part You won't be on top, kid. Got to be able to take it. But 75,000 people in this building, man, was pretty damn cool for me. Austin being relentless, you know, it was, uh, I think, you know, Steve knowing and not really so much even so that he was he was already turning heel. Steve always worked like a heel anyway. You know, even as a baby face, but I think that Steve here knowing where he's going was was just trying to turn it up even more so. Rock with a beautiful clothesline, Austin down selling. Now, and everybody, you know, still to this day, I think that the, uh, you know, the best match on the card was obviously the gimmick battle royal that I should have won. Listen to you. What? What was your favorite match on the card? I just can't believe you would say that out loud. What? That I should have won or that it was best match on the card? Either. Well, hell. Corny and I tore that damn place down. And then me and Michael Hayes and the goon, that was a big, big time rivalry. Can't even listen to you. The ring bell coming back into the ring. It's already been a part of the match on the outside, but now rock's got it. He's got to return the favor. Need change the color of Steve's face here. 
if he hits him, connects, oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Steve's face is a crimson mask. Talk to me about this. How's the referee okay with what's happening here? He takes a little bit of leniency. And I believe, actually, before this match, and this is the shit that used to just kind of get to me a little bit. And, and I had, I was resigned to it by this point. But if you go back to the early Attitude Era with with Russo and some of the stuff, and Russo was not here during this time, had nothing to do with it, not blaming him at all. I am blaming him for originally allowing allowing us to get to this point. But it would be the guys would get there and they would lay out a match, and the match would be all this gaga all over the place. Would you know be out of the ring for three, four, five minutes and use a bunch of gimmicks and all this other shit. And I would say, why aren't they being counted out? Why aren't they being disqualified? And Pat would look at me and go, ah, just make it to no DQ. Fuck it. And that would make everything all right. So a lot of times we would just slide in, you know, right before match, you know, uh, president Jack Tunney or whoever the hell it was at that time, uh, has made this match, no DQ match. And then they could do whatever the hell they wanted, but we didn't, we didn't have, if you're going to do that to me, those should be special and you should promote it and build up to it. Right. It's, instead it was just the match. You know what I mean? But Austin ble- bleeding like a stuck pig by God. Let's see if they go back out in the audience now. See, and I always hated the referee coming outside with the guys. You can't score a pinfall out there. You can't make someone submit outside the ring. But the referee's still out there. Rock writhing in pain by God. Earl saying, damn it. Bruce is yelling at me, telling me all to get back in the ring. Really? That's what you're doing right here. No, probably not because I was brother love that night. That was big star. I was, I was resting up. I was resting up from exerting all that energy in the, uh, gimmick battle Royal. I was actually probably still standing there. My brother love stuff watching this match. And now we've got the Spanish announce table, the English announce table, and everything in between all completely destroyed at ringside. You know what I do miss nowadays at ringside, though? What's that? Ah, <sighs> the fink. Everybody does. I just so, you know, and, and I, I look back and I go and I know that we always had fun at Fink's expense, but I really miss seeing Howard in the ring, seeing him at ringside and, and hearing his announcements. He was the best man, part of all of our childhood. And then you also notice that the chairs are just, uh, those are just stadium chairs there versus the big, nice, comfy office swiveling wheel, wheelie chairs that they have now. Her trash or fresh. Did you say swiveling wheelie chairs? Yeah. Are you just making up words? No, the swivelly wheelie chairs, you know, they're on wheels and they're swivelly. No, no, yeah. Those aren't, those aren't, those aren't English words. Yeah. They're made out of plush pleather. You know, Double finger salute. By God, rock going to the scorpion death lock. Because Steve looks so damn good when he's a bloody mess in the scorpion. Can you imagine that happening today? Going back to double, double juice and double guys bleeding here and shooting it. Nope, folks, it ain't going to happen today. Ooh, 
Rock barely having the hold on, trying to keep Austin in the middle of the ring. With Steve getting up so everybody can see his face and sell. Cheer for me, Steve. Crawl, you bastard. Who did you think was going to win this some bitch? I thought the rock was going to win. Why? Well, just because stone cold took the first one. Ah, very good. So I just assumed, well, he won last time. So you gotta let the other guy win. That's right. Cause it's wrestling mania. Yeah. Hey, Nice little spots there, man. You know, going through this and just seeing all the different machinations, the double fuck use. Now, Austin going to the Scorpion. Now, let's see if we can get that same shot from Rock. Can he arch his back the same way? I don't know that he had as much experience as Steve did arching his back. There you go. Look at the pain. Look at the crimson mask. Ah, ah, dude, recreating WrestleMania 13 in a big way. Are they not on both sides, man? That's beautiful. And now rock showing, well, by God, I'll get up and I'll give you even more and better. Yeah, I guess when I look back and I think of the story about this match going all the way through it. And you think events coming out and yes, we're getting ahead of ourselves here, but I, you know, when you're talking about it and you're planning everything out for the, for the future and laying this thing out, it sounds so much better when you're, you're thinking about it until you actually see it happen. And that's when I went, Oh fuck, I don't like it. Baby Earl, you know, a couple years ago, Earl just would have called for the bell. That's what he does. Sometimes people are in the, the damn scorpion. The Astrodome never looked prettier folks. I gotta tell you, I didn't know. That this thing wasn't really used much more than that. I remember it being, you know, a site for Katrina refugees when people were in real trouble in Louisiana that they were camping out there. But I didn't know outside of that, it really had a pretty limited history. But I guess, you know, with that new Texas Houston or the Houston Texans stadium opening up right next door, Reliant, maybe that made sense. Yeah, it did, but this was still such a, you know, for so many years, they call it the eighth wonder of the world. It was the first dome stadium and it was a, a huge deal that a lot of people just never wanted to see it come down and really fought to keep it going. And now there's, there's seems like there's a bill every time you vote on what to do with the Astrodome. They still haven't decided all these years later, what are we 17 years later, what to do with the damn thing. Oh, it's kind of fun right there. Cause that was the finish of survivor series, 1996 with Bret Hart and stone cold, Steve Austin. And of course, before that at WrestleMania eight with Roddy Piper and Bret Hart, and they tried it there. And I'm a big fan of that spot, the sleeper hold, the push off in the corner. And Hey, it's a pin now. Exactly. In Austin measuring his punches, man. God, and uh, there you go. Rock with Stone Cold's finisher, man, hitting him with his own damn finish. This has got to be it. It's got to be. And I forget what, what movie Rock was going to after this. I think this was uh, where he went and did the football movie right after this. No. No? What did he do? Probably Scorpion King. Uh, you did Scorpion King after this? Okay, cool. Uh-oh. 
Uh oh. I'm just guessing. Scorpion King came out in 02. I think he'd already done it. Yeah. Here comes Mr. Mac, man. I don't know why Vince liked to work in jeans. So you think the movie that he was taping here is Gridiron Gang that came out four years later or Game Plan that came out six years later? I think it was Game Plan. The, the one with the little girl in it. Okay. I think is the one so, he was doing here. Okay. So that movie came out in 2007, but you think he taped it in 01. Got it. Yeah, I do. Because okay. it, it didn't come out right away. But I don't know. He went away to do a movie after this. <laughs> I'm wrong, but I'm not admitting it. Shut up, Conrad. No, I'm not. It could be anything. He did a lot of movies that came out like three and four years later. Oh, but this one was six years, but that still fine. Right? Yeah. yeah. A lot of movies come out six and eight years later. Okay, cool. Sometimes 20. Yeah, I yeah. got it. I understand. All right, then. So, so the eight year old girl who was in this, by the time it was time to do media, she was 15, but that makes sense, right? Yes. Okay. Now you're following. Yeah. Now everybody knows that the fix is in. Austin's going to get fucked. Master Mac man's out there. Did you say master Mac man? Well, if it's, if it's Mr. Macman, then it can be Master Macman. Uh oh, what the hell? Oh no! Ah oh, no! So McMahon slides in and pulls the Rock's foot to where he pulls him off of the cover, and now the Rock and McMahon are locking eyes like. What the fuck is going on? And the audience is happy because they think that McMahon is turning baby face here. It's always funny to watch Vince run too. Comes in right into rock a rock bottom. bottom. The rock gave him a lot there. Oh no. Watch it. He's got him. Here. Are you okay? No. Well, yeah, the, you know, it's, 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 again, the, the, it's like, <sighs> yeah, it's, it's yeah, frustrating. Yeah, I like fucking with the audience, but they so badly wanted Steve to win this. And they're, they're thinking they're happy if Vince is turning baby face, but they're confused right now. Nice low blow by Steve. And I think the entire audience has got the same, same damn look on their face that, that Vince McMahon does, but now Steve calling for the chair. And here just, you could hear a pin drop of people going, what the fuck? And knowing that Rock's going to move. And he doesn't. So again, there's still, uh, you know, the, the, it just, for me, it was just way too confusing at this point. Because there were no clear lines. And it's a main event. I, I would have liked to have seen a main event without all the shenanigans. I don't even mind the shenanigans if they were fucking clear. Can you tell us a fan? Did you know what was going on at the time? No. And that's my point. And I guess, you know, Vince's argument was people are going to be guessing. People are wondering what's the hell going on. And that's good because they're engaged. Um, but it was bad confusion. And Steve's trying to be a heel, but the more Steve is a heel, the more they cheer it. Right. And now there's, now they're cheering fucking rock. Giving Steve the rock bottom. And 
And now baby face move because you're getting the heel McMahon in here. But rock was supposed to be the heel. A nice stunner. Nobody took the stunner like the rock. What do you think of the rock style of selling a stunner? <laughs> um, I enjoyed it because he would get up with it. He, he would get some height on that damn thing and come down and sell the living shit out of it. Sometimes he would go over the top and go hokey, but I love the way that he did it. He had great timing with it. So this is chair shot. Number three. From Stone Cold to The Rock, bab bada bang boom. And Earl Hebner for the count. Still not three. And what the hell do they have to do? And I think people at this point knew Rock was going to make a comeback and that Rock was going to beat him here eventually. The looks between Austin McMahon, it just, holy shit, just 70,000 plus man going, okay, wait a minute. What the fuck, Steve? No, Steve, no. Well, yeah, go ahead. Hit him. Hit him some more. Fuck him. And I could tell you rock was hurting like son of a bitch after them chair shots and the crowd pops, but I think they're still confused. Like, I think they're confused as hell. And the, and the question on everybody's mind was why did Vince turn baby face? And nobody, nobody went the other way with, you know, Steve turning heel and Vince was like, they'll get it. Once we shake hands. And here, there's the mega power shake right there. God damn it. will be the most powerful entity and uh, great match. The match itself up until Vince coming out, I thought was spectacular and told a hell of a story. Um, but even here going off of the air, the biggest show of the year. And this was the other thing Vince always hated, you know, blood in WrestleMania, especially for the winner of the match, because he never wanted that picture of them with the championship and having a bloody face. Really? Yeah. Hated it. That's fascinating to me. Hogan had Hogan had it at WrestleMania seven. Yep. Austin's got it here. I don't know if anybody else ever did. Uh, maybe Hogan did at WrestleMania two as well. But you remember With, specifically him not locking it at seven? Hated it. Hey, he, it, in general, um, I forget what, Matt, maybe it was Randy and, and Hulk where they wanted to get color and Vince was dead set against it because he didn't want Hulk to be all bloody with the championship at the end. Wanted that victory shot with no blood. And then we did it at seven, did it here 10 years later, but Crazy little Vinnie Mac quirks. Indeed. Indeed. So there you go, well, there you man. Go. An interesting, listen to you. We've been hanging out too much. I can't believe that, uh, we finally did a lot of watch along for this. Of course, we're going to cover the entire show sometime on the regular podcast, but let's run our time out today to talk about money. I'm talking to you. If you haven't yet gone to save with Conrad.com, get yourself a quick quote right now. I'm telling you, you'll be glad you did. We have routinely helped our podcast listeners save tens of thousands of dollars worth of unnecessary interest. And you can do it too. You don't need perfect credit or money out of your pocket. In fact, if I can't save you money, I won't waste your time. Lately, we've been able to help some of our listeners get rates in the twos and threes. And when you hear that, you know, you're overpaying when it comes to things like your second mortgage, your home equity line of credit, credit card debt, or even your current home loan, especially if you're in a 30 year loan. And if you're in a 30 year loan, I really want you to do me this one favor today. Take your monthly payment and listen, you know it by heart. 
take your monthly payment and multiply it by 360. I know you got to go find a calculator. You've got one on your phone where you're probably listening to this show right now. Just pull it out. Do this one favor for me. Listen, you trust my match recommendations. Why wouldn't you take a look at this? Take your monthly payment, multiply it by 360. That's how many payments you're making in a 30 year loan. That big, scary number. That's what we call the total of payments. And that's what you're actually paying for your house. You see, most people think what they're paying for the house is whatever they paid the guy who lived there before them. No, no, no. That's not what you're paying. That's what the bank paid him. Now, the number you see in your calculator, that's what you're paying the bank. It's too damn much. Keep more of your own money, get out of debt faster, shorten your term, reduce your interest rate. And I'm telling you, your monthly payment is more affordable than you ever thought possible. We routinely have this conversation with podcast listeners where they say, oh, I've checked into a 15 year loan. I can't afford that, man. You can't afford not to think about how old you will be 30 years from now. Dude, that is unreal compared to 15 years from now. And when you put that in perspective of how old will I be when I pay my house off, you realize, man, Houston, we got a problem. Let me show you how to get out of debt faster and with cheaper monthly payments. Because here's the thing. You're not where you were when you first bought your house. You were worried about movers and hanging TVs and ordering a new couch and getting blinds and trying to save up for a fence. It's business as usual right now. Let's get out of debt and let's do it fast. And maybe it's not business as usual. Maybe you're a little strapped for cash. Keep more of your own money by getting rid of all your credit card debt and skipping your next two house payments. We have helped so many podcast listeners in the last six or eight weeks, say five, six, seven, even 800 bucks a month. And you get to skip your next two house payments. I'm saying no payments in May, no payments in June and come July, you could be saving five, six, seven, even 800 bucks a month. But the real savings is by shortening your term. And we have helped countless listeners save more than $100,000 worth of unnecessary interest. How much can you save? Find out right now for free at savewithconrad.com. NMLS number 65084, equal housing lender. And oh yeah, we're licensed in more than 40 states. Run the numbers right now. I'm telling you, you'll be glad you did. It's savewithconrad.com. You know, I should mention, I do have a newfound appreciation for this show, WrestleMania 17, uh, because early this year, I actually was lucky enough to get the big Eagle from that match. So the world title that the rock lost to Steve Austin in that match, I actually was able to acquire. And I got to tell you, when I knew that I was getting a big Eagle, uh, I really wasn't sure which one it would be. And there's certain tells that you can sort of date a belt with. And, uh, now that I think about it. I haven't uploaded footage of that. I guess I should mention I've been showing pieces of my collection over at adfreeshows.com because we get a lot of requests like, Hey, when are you going to give us a tour of your house? Never. Uh, it's not MTV cribs. What are we doing? Uh, but you guys do want to see some of my memorabilia and I appreciate that. So I've started to share certain pieces and sort of tell the story and I'll work with uh, Dave Silva to get that up over the next few days where we let you guys take a look at the world title from WrestleMania 17 and how I knew, uh, that it was, uh, that particular belt. Uh, but without further ado, let's get in our way back machine and let's talk about one more clip that I want to play. And I don't know why I even love this show so much, but I've talked about it a lot here on the show where it's almost comical. How you guys know what I'm going to say, but 1997 was my favorite year as a wrestling fan. You know, it's when I really fell back in love with wrestling and I was just hooked in a major way. And February of 97 is just a fucking disaster for the WWF. You know, we're coming off the heels of Royal Rumble where Shawn Michaels was sick as a dog in the main event against Sid and Austin had a tremendous performance, but they did a bit of a cluster finish with the idea being it would set up at our in your house pay-per-view in Chattanooga in February. But along the way, of course, Shawn lost his fucking smile. And man, it just created all kinds of chaos. So now instead of the final four setting up, maybe who was going to be the number one contender for Sean at WrestleMania. Now it's to crown a new champion. And then immediately the next night they switch it again. So there's just so many moving parts and I'm just fascinated with it. But along the way, what gets lost in all of the lost my smile hubbub is man, they had a hell of a fucking match at in your house, 1997 the final four from February 
unbelievable match in Chattanooga. It's a four way. You've got Vader. Who's going to bleed like a fucking stuck pig. The undertaker, Bret Hart and Steve Austin, four of my absolute favorites. And they went out there to prove a point and just rip shit up. It's a bloody brawl. I absolutely love it. A guilty pleasure of mine. And we covered it on our old Patreon. Uh, and again, all of these old clips are at adfreeshows.com, but fire it up, man. WWE network find in your house, February, 1997 final four is the name of the show from Chattanooga, Tennessee. Let's watch the main event with Bruce and get his take on one of my favorite matches from the period, the main event for the world title in your house, 1997 final four. This went down in Chattanooga, February 16th. Uh, famously, this is a few days after Shawn Michaels forfeited the world title on raw cause he lost his smile. And so now they've said that the original plan where it's the final four participants from the Royal rumble before Steve Austin was eliminated, but a referee didn't see it. And therefore he stole the win instead of it being to determine the number one contender. It's instead going to be to crown a new world champion. So we're going to go through all of that story and one hell of a match, super underrated. It's going to run about a half hour. And we want you to fire up in your house, final four, 1997 from February 16th, 1997 right now, Bruce, are you ready? I am ready. And the timestamp is one ten forty three. One ten forty three. fire it up, right. go to one ten forty three. We're going to count to three and then press play. So if you're not ready, just hit pause and find it. One ten forty three. Bruce, are you ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. Conrad. Here we go. Livio, are you ready? Livio's ready. Three. All right. Two, one, play. Let me see the blimp here getting us going. The WWF blimp. That was a Western Union blimp, I think, at this time, wasn't it? Yeah. Can you read that? Howard Finkel, ladies and gentlemen. With Baby Earl over my left shoulder, Gorilla Monsoon. Boy, this was during a time when I didn't like the way Gorilla looked, man. He was starting to get sick and lost a lot of weight. But speaking of someone didn't lose a lot of weight. No, I can't speak that badly of those guys. Why are you being like a dick? I'm not. I used to poke fun at Paul Bear. Paul Bear and I used to poke fun at each other. Big Leon. Who the man? Who the man? It's time. It's stinky time. Did you just say it's stinky time? Yeah. He's dead. I love big Leon. Leon would appreciate that. You're, you're mean much, much respect. Hey, no, I'm not much respect for Leon. I like Leon. You just said it's stinky time. Well, yeah, he didn't always smell the best and his gloves were positively disgusting. His gloves are really stinky. Oh, well, we gathered I mean, that. You said it's stinky time. It, I mean, like, no, they're putrid. Like he could win the match right now if all he did was cup someone with his gloves. And just I would tap the fuck out. <laughs> and he hadn't even started working yet. And it's stinky time. And it's stinky time. I think that he he soaked him in stinky oil. Stinky oil. Yeah. Do you hear yourself? Vader time. It's stinky time. I love big Leon. I'm sad. He's gone. Everybody is nice. Damn heel. Cold stone. Steve Austin, by God. Stomping his way to the ring. Sticky time. Oh man. He knows it. He's like, oh damn that damn Vader better stay away from me with them fucking steak ass gloves. Like I left goddamn deer out for a fucking season. Come back and. Open up. Oh, he touched him. Look at him. Look at him. Sticky time. Him. Oh yeah. Uh, so that's why Steve's fucking running. Steve's selling. Steve don't want to smell that shit in his face. Stinky time. It's stinky. It's stinky. It's stinky time. I wonder if, um, that's where the, he's gonna, he's gonna came from. <laughs> it's gotta be, it's gotta be. <laughs> That's gotta be Vader. <laughs> I guess that's the thing. It's Stone Cold, Stone Cold, Undertaker. 
a scary undertaker during this time. I got to tell you my takeaway already. Like I'm going to do it for the rest of the show. Now stick it down. Well, it's going to be bulging, bulging eyelid time coming up in a little bit too. I, I'm spoiling everything. Aren't I? You are. You can't help yourself. I'm a goddamn spoiler. It's water time on my hair. Now there was a period there. Undertaker used to do this and he would raise the lights and we had concussions, which pyro on each of the corners that would go off. And for a run of about six weeks, there were two or three different times that the pyro guy loaded the corner that undertaker was in and he had one job to do load th three pyros not the pyro where the steps are and boy on the last time that he did it undertaker came back and said you know what never gonna happen again <laughs> and it was in that authoritative voice that guess what it never happened again there's a Hermie. Isn't that what Rocky used to call him? Oh, Kevin my Hermie. gosh. Yes, he did call him Hermie once. No, more than once. You're being very mean. I am. This is, this is the, uh, a mean extra for Livio, especially for Livio. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go out there because I've been fucked again. And if anybody's going to screw me, I'm going to screw me. And if you read his lips, that is what he said. Just telling you. Is that me a gorilla? Am I a gorilla? Did we already pass me? Oh, there I am. No. Yeah, that was me. I went in the dark of the darkness. Did you ever, um, rub one out back there? What? What again? Penises. Your fascination with penises. Eh. It, I do not understand. This is Patron. We're not selling anything on Patron. So you can't be fascinated with penises and pulling on penises. This is not a penis pulling Patron. So that's a yes. God bless America. Dun, 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 dun. This is my Brett. That was my, I was singing all of those, the words to Brett's song. No, no, you like it. You know, you did. Brett's going to find some young child. Give him his wet ass. Could you imagine if Vader did that with his gloves before the match? Oh my God. Or, <laughs> or after the match or in the parking lot or anywhere. Or yeah, I mean, just if Leon came at you with the hands outstretched, it would be like, see, people thought that he was stiff in the ring with the punches and shit. That wasn't what they were selling. It's like, oh my God, the smell. Oh my God. Now folks, what you're about to see here is probably one of the best, uh, fatal four ways that ever has been. Undertaker and Leon just tee off on each other. And there were times when Undertaker would say, you know what? I'm not going to wash my gloves. See how he likes it. And he didn't notice he being Vader. Big clothesline, big bumping motherfucker. Good I mean, shit. This is uh, one of my favorite matches from the era. And you were watching during this time. Oh, I loved it. Loved it. Well, hell yeah, because old Cold Stone was coming on as a heel, and uh, Cold Stone was over. Cold Stone was over like a motherfucker right here, man, as a heel. And Vince was like, he's a heel. Old little old school from the dead man. Never gets old. Doesn't. By, by the way, I did not like this look on The Undertaker. My least favorite of The Undertaker looks. This was his flaming pirate look? Yeah, when he came down. From uh, Survivor Series, Madison Square Garden, from the roof. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of it. By the way, Vader doesn't know what he's about to get fucked up. Yeah, he sure is, man. And uh, if you watch this very closely, uh, again, 
it was it was Leon that had the damn chair the wrong way. So shit happens, and as they say in wrestling circles, this ain't ballet. So he should have had the chair the other way because he's going to take it. So he has it the right way as if he were going to hit someone with it. And that wasn't it just yet, but it was, uh, he'll pick it up the same damn way. And he has it the right way. If you're going to hit somebody with it that way. But unfortunately he's the one getting hit with it. And that corner of that chair just like ripped into his eyeball. Like you would not believe. And Dave Meltzer probably would say, and you see Vader down there cutting himself, which no folks. This is what we call in the wrestling business a hard way. We still haven't got a shot of it yet. It's coming. In the meantime, go ahead. No, I'm just saying it's coming. Yeah, and in the meantime, Brett and, and Austin are in the ring just tearing it up as well. It's an underrated match. I'm glad that our, our main man Livio picked this one. Yeah, it really and truly is. It's it's uh, just on so many levels, but there the, the side of the chair just caught Vader right in the eye and busted his ass up good. Bruce, take your pills. Thank you. That was my pill alarm. I know. I can't I don't know how to make it silent. I turn off all my stuff and then it still it wants me to take my pills. The shades of the stone cold stunner taking bread out from the damn, uh, sleeper hold there. Now I forget. I know you and I just watched this match. This was, was this an elimination? This was an elimination, wasn't it? Um, you know, I don't remember. I guess we're going to see. I, I haven't seen it in a while. Well, you and I just watched it, but that was a lot. That was like almost three weeks ago, two weeks ago. Okay, maybe I, a week and a half. I think ago. we started this. I don't think we finished. Okay, I'll, let's stick with that anyway. And look at this gruesome cut over Vader's eye. Ugh. And oh, yeah, Ugh. get some of that stinkiness. Ugh. Why does that got to right. be stinky, too? You're being mean. Well, I'm just saying because he's, you know, he's going to follow up with the glove in the face somewhere. By the way, uh, this pay per view got 64.5% thumbs up. And. Meltzer would start the newsletter that week by saying perhaps the strangest week in Royal wrestling federation history ended with three WWF title changes. The tease of Shawn Michaels career, uh, a strange twist in the working relationship with ECW, the beginning of the live raw, a television special, a pay-per-view event, a surprise, IC title switch, numerous long-term plans, switch steroids appeared back to being somewhat in vogue and perhaps not limited to the male performers and the beginning of WrestleMania hype all crammed into five days. Invaders still okay. There he goes. See that time he turned the chair around the right way. Yeah, he learned the oh. hard way. By the way, this match got four and a quarter stars in the Observer. Well, this match was a great match, and uh, it was it told a hell of a story. And getting to uh, Brett with the championship. Did I spoil something again? Yeah. Damn it, Bruce! What the hell am I doing? Fucking everything up. You sh why I gotta do that. I don't know why you do it. I just know you do it. Well, that was a nice backdrop. You know what? It's history, Conrad. It's not like we're watching it live and I know the finish and I'm giving it away. Like you, some people. What you do know the finish to what? Never mind. Okay. And you know, and you know, the, the, the beautiful thing, man, everybody kind of going after everybody, everyone pairing off in this damn thing to where it, it's constant action. And a lot of this, you know, I, I've got to just say that you've got undertaker and Bret Hart in there, two of the best, uh, Leon, who was a workhorse and, and Austin who guys that were always thinking about everything going on in the match and just trying to, to make the match the best thing that people could always remember and, and asking good questions. So it's, it's an example of, of four guys that are being pretty damn unselfish and taking care of business. But, uh, Vader, Jesus, 
every time I look at that eye, oh, smell these gloves. I oh, yeah, smell it again. Yeah, see, Steve's begging off. It's like, okay, I'm done. In the ring, Taker and Brett working their ass off. Austin's ready to puke right here. Look at that. God damn, get your hand off my, around my nose. Easy, big man. And we still got the old wire barricades around the uh, around the ring. I love those barricades. Makes me think of wrestling. That makes you think of wrestling. How about Vader? Wasn't sure what to do. It was like trying to slow down and was trying to jump over tables and steps and. And, and needed... instead goes in and kills Frank. Frank's not sure what to do. Frank's just hiding and trying to not to get killed. Frank's trying to be small. Yes. And for those of you that don't know who Frank is, Frank is a guy cowering there in the corner. He was our audio man. And he also pet played Benjamin Franklin on several occasions throughout the years. Ugh. Do you think if, if Vader came to your house with that gash wide open, that Ginger would want to lick his face? No. Ginger, I bet she would. Ginger would probably think he was too stinky. I know, but dog dogs have a different stink threshold. Your dog does. My dog's real domesticated. Um, Conrad. Yeah. That's just not true. I love Ginger. Ginger's a good dog. She's the official something to wrestle dog. No, that would be Dodger. No, she could be the fit. She could be the official female. Hey, the Dodger's the official. You're not allowed to call her the official bitch. Yep. She is the official bitch. No. Yes, she is. No, but she is. No. And that big Leon and Brett going out into the crowd and the, in the crowds are going, what is that smell? I love that. This is just. Your opportunity to just shit it on him. No, that's what it smelled like. Like he shitted it in his gloves. <laughs> I don't know why that was funny when you did it. Shit it, 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 it. Well, that's what happens sometimes. Now, who did Paul Bear come out with here? Did Paul Bear come out with Undertaker or Vader? Vader. Oh. Poor Paul. Paul, you know, Paul loved working against the Undertaker, and there's Psycho Sid. He's pissed. He's getting a title shot the very next night, by the way. Oh, uh, he's pissed. So Vader can't can't get turned all the way over on the damn sharpshooter. That is hilarious. Leon tried, Leon tried to put the sharpshooter on the way Brett puts it on and couldn't figure it out. Hello, Mr. Stairs. Man, these guys are having an all out fucking war and it's in Chattanooga. Of course. And Steve Austin and I played bumper cars the night before in Ch <laughs> Chattanooga. What's the story? Uh, well, the story was that we both had, uh, rental vehicles and we had, we had been out to a Japanese restaurant the evening before and coming back, I had someone in the car and they were just, uh, almost in awe that they had been out with Steve Austin that night and coming home, uh, all of a sudden my car got tapped from behind and it was Steve just saying hello. So we said hello all the way back to the hotel. Sometimes I got behind him and said hello. Sometimes he got behind me and said hello. Very minimal damage to the car, so they made good bumpers then. So a bumper was a bumper. I and mean, that was a bump there by Vader, by God. You know, we make light of Vader, and I talk about his stinky gloves. That son of a bitch was a big working bastard. No, yeah, I mean, I don't think anybody can debate that. He's one of the best ever. 
Yep. And he's also, you know, deceptively big too. He's, he's, he's not a short man. He was a big goddamn, just, uh, unbelievable athlete. And there goes Brett with the pile driver on Steve. They should outlaw that damn pile driver. Uh, uh-uh, not tonight. Only two. Now, while I do think this, this is, this got to be, this is an elimination match. I'm pretty positive of it now, but why in the hell don't we, if we've got four guys in there, why don't we have two referees? It's a great call. We got one on the out. We have an outside referee and an inside referee, but what happens if like Brett were to pin Steve right now and undertaker were to, to pin Vader right now, one referee can't coat, can't count both men down. I mean, I guess he could, but he can't. Know what I'm saying? Yep. I believe the deal is they're trying to throw him over the top rope, though, to simulate that Royale Rumble. Oh, the Rumble Royal. Yeah. I think, I think that show's getting over that whole Royale Rumble. Well, shit. I no. didn't even think about that, Conrad. I mean, that's what this is a continuation of, not the, the month before or whatever. That's a very good point right there because cold stone, Steve Austin, he done trick Bret Hart, Bret Hart thought he won, but he didn't. Oh no, not the dreaded, uh, cables. Oh no. You know, this was another thing that some guys just didn't get. You're, you're taking a cable <laughs> that ties directly into the production of the program that you're participating on right now. You don't know what you're grabbing. Don't grab it. And sometimes we'd have to explain that to, to the guys every once in a while. So as you see here, uh, Bret Hart trying to get cold stone over the top rope, but by God, he ain't going. And Brett punches in the wee wee right there. Paul bear on the outside with that urn. Now Undertaker's in pain because he's got a good whiff of those gloves right now. Oh, space. God. I thought it was because he was getting goozled, and you're like, nope, that's not what he means. Well, he was. He's getting goozled by the glove. Man, I wish, I, I seriously, I wish that we could go back in time. And you were of age at this point in time, weren't you? I, I was uh, 15 years old. I, I wish I could take you back and scar you as a 15 year old by letting you smell one of those gloves just one time. Why? Well, then you would understand. You would no longer have a fascination with other men's penises. You would be fascinated what? with the stench that comes from leather gloves after they've been worn consistently without being washed for years upon end. What are you talking about? Other men's penises. You'd like to talk about other men's penises. I don't even know what you're talking about. Oh, you know, <laughs> you know, I think you're being very weird right now. You're weird. Well, these some bitches are still going. The beautiful thing about it is, is they've made this son of a bitch flow. Like, uh, there's been no lull, no, nothing no. dull. They're, they're just getting it. And Brett and Vader are beating the living shit out of each other in the middle of the ring. And I mean, those clubbing hands by Vader uh, hurt and, and Brett's going to throw a tater if he needs to. And Steve's going to just whack taker's leg here, right there. And you know, yeah, this was the worst look for the undertaker, in my opinion. I love a Bret like, Hart Russian leg sweep. Oh, uh, some bitch did it. Uh, the best Russian leg sweep in the business, Bret Hart and Brad Armstrong. What about Sandman? Where do you put his? I uh, said Bret Hart and uh, Brad Armstrong. I know. I asked I about can't. Sandman because he uses the cane. I thought the cane was a fun little thing. Oh, okay. I can't say I really recall it. Well, because you hate him. I don't hate, oh God, I love him personally. Yeah. You just hate his company and his wrestling. 
No, I didn't hate them either. Kept them in business for many years. Oh, you personally kept them in business? Me personally. That's cool. I, we really appreciate you. Out of my leather wallet. I don't know why, but the leather wallet really set it off. <laughs> with, uh, with macrame on it. Yeah, that's right. I, I don't even know what macrame is. How do you not know what macrame is? Well, I don't know. I'm from Alabama. The macrame capital of the world. What the fuck is a macrame? Macrame is a stitching kind of thingy. Oh God. That's so gross. Who does that? Macrame experts from Alabama. That's what they, that's what they call Alabama. Oh, Steve Austin over the top, but no, uh, uh, not to the floor. Feet didn't touch. Saved by the bell. If you will. Is that your Gordon Soli? Ah, I do. I kind of do a cross between Gordon Sully uh, uh, and Lance Russell. Oh my! No, I don't. I don't know. Lance Russell has got uh, Lance Russell does the ah uh, ah, uh, or is that Gordon? It's been a while. Uh, Undertaker to his vertical base now, uh, looking to hit the German Sioux play. Jack Briscoe and Gordon Sully were good friends, and that drove Jack Briscoe nuts that Gordon would call it a suplex instead of suplex. You don't like that? It's incorrect. Steve Austin to the floor, been eliminated. He's out of here, folks. Finally. It's been a long time coming, and the Bret Hart fans love it. But meanwhile, he's still stuck in there with two bloody monsters. Well, one bloody monster and one dead man. Exactly. And that bloody monster is throwing some stinky fists. Jerry Briscoe. Come on, Leon, get to the back. No, Steve cold stone. I just got Leon on the brain and Rene Gallet. The clown is down. Go to the back. Judge says Steve Austin at a pace. He's French Canadian too. Actually, I think Rennie is, uh, is real French. Real French, yeah, real French. What is what is real French? I mean, how's it as different? opposed to gimmick French, like French Canadian? Oh, I didn't know French Canadian was gimmick French. Uh, yeah, French Canadian is kind of gimmick French. I'm gonna have to start using that. I love that. That's the thing. What's that? Gimmick French? Yeah. Well, yeah. See, Montreal and Quebec, they kind of are their own province and they want to be their own state and they want to have the national language be French. But, um, some of the best food you'll ever eat up there. Look at psycho Sid boy. He wants somebody. Uh, 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 uh no, I'm crazy. I'm going to talk to myself and slap myself in the face right now. Yeah. Don't ask me who I was doing. I don't, I don't know. I don't, know. <laughs> I don't either. I just know you're a little punchy today. Well, I'm sorry. Livio accepts it. You know, I mean, I've called Livio all hours of the day and night to thank him for getting shirts and shit. And always it's like, dude, how many shirts do you have? And now I appreciate it. Now Vader's tired of the mask. It's a wonder he had it on this long. If we're honest. Well, this is true. And what's scarier with the mask or without? Cause I got to tell you him with that big old gushing eye is a scary sight coming at you. Now, oh, that damn Paul bear, that son of a bitch. See, I missed that over there before in the live feed. There he goes. Oh yes. Now here's another little known fact. Check out uh, the bottom of Leon's boots. I'm looking at him. Okay. Now, Leon, as I said before, he's a big bastard. I mean, he's tall. He's big. He still has like two inch lifts in his boots. Oh, that is nasty. And not for one second did he ever think of stopping the match because of a gash like that. You're saying that like somebody has, who would stop a match like that? Well, I don't, I don't know of anybody that would ever, ever done it back in the day. 
I'm just saying, you know, times have changed and, and people, you know, get, get a cut or do things like that. And, and matches get stopped. And, you know, now WWE for safety, they do it. They have doctors at ringside that if the gash is too bad, they'll stop the match. That's cray cray. Uh Oh, Austin's back out. Do we get to see Jerry Briscoe come back out too? It is sort of interesting. Austin still here trying to screw with Bret Hart. I mean, that's the storyline. Well, hell yeah. And there's Gerald. God damn it. Stone cold. Mr. Matt. Don't make me, don't make me take you down out here in front of everybody. Mr. McMahon wants your ass in the back. And I love Pat just kind of looks at him like he's confused. Out of pace. I just check your pace. Yeah. That's good shit. But none of them, I like how none of them get in the ring. And Vader's been eliminated. And in this entire melee, Vader has now been eliminated. And could, you know what? Could Cold Stone and uh, Undertaker be in cahoots here? You think? I don't know. That could be. It definitely could be. But Leon has is, is, is been summoned to the back. Brett trying to take advantage of the situation, but he is caught by the purple dead man. Oh, yes. Please don't touch this suit. I've got to wear it for three more days. And folks, here's the end. Because when Taker cuts his own throat, it's over. Taking up Brett by the hair. Stone Cold still trying to get back in. He grabs- Austin trying to bring Brett over. Ah, uh-uh. ah. Stone Cold causing the hitman to crotchel himself. You know, this is a damn good match. And Holy take shit. a look. Brett sees the opportunity, goes for a pin. And Brett and Steve still going after it. And voila, Brett takes advantage. That's bullshit. That was Stone Cold and Brett were in cahoots. And Brett is your new world champion. A lot of people forget this. I just had a guy try to argue with me the other day that Brett was not a five-time champion. He was a four-time champion, but that's not true. This is number four and he's going to lose it the very next day on raw to Sid. This is a spoiler. Um, oh man, I was going to watch that. All the plans were thrown out the window here. You know, the original idea was supposed to be Brett versus Sean. And Brett was still going to win the match here, but he would have been the number one contender that would have set up your WrestleMania 13 main event. But instead they had to pivot. So when he lost his smile, they pivoted to this the very next day though, Sid would beat Brett and that set Brett up would lose a smile. Yeah. Cause he would say that he's been screwed and no, we've got a natural feud here. Stone cold and Brett at WrestleMania greatest match ever. And the Undertaker and Sid. Well, that's going to have us heading for the hills here. We're going to go ahead and start wrapping things up. I do want to mention that uh, this was not the original plan. As a reminder, again, this is sort of a make good. Uh, this is as good as we can do on short notice. As I'm talking to you now, it's uh, nearly 930 on Thursday night. I'm going to get this over to Matt Coon. He'll help stitch all this together. And we're still going to work on recording Hacksaw Jim Duggan, which was very much the original plan. Of course, uh, unprecedented times means that uh, Bruce can't record until Sunday. But at some point on Sunday, Bruce and I are going to get together, click record, and uh, I'll keep you guys updated at Hey Hey, It's Conrad. I do want to mention we're also going to endeavor this week to record a bonus show. It's going to be where Bruce and I sit down and watch the April 28th, 1990 Saturday night's main event. It's a who's who, man. You've got all the big stars on this one. Some of your absolute favorites. This is one of my favorite episodes of Saturday night's main event, just because I remember it so well, and I can't wait to talk about it with you guys coming up next week on the regular feed though. It's backlash 2005. Uh, We've got uh, Hunter Hearst Helmsley. Uh, Of course, he's going to be in there with Batista. It's a bit of a rematch from WrestleMania on May 8th. 
Frankie Kazarian's going to be tickled because we're talking about Tito Santana. True story. Just a couple of days ago in the middle of all this quarantine, I get a random text from Frankie that says, Hey, hypothetically, would you ever cover Tito Santana on any of your shows? I said, yes, I would stay tuned, but May 8th is happening. And I got to tell you, I've really enjoyed going back and doing some personality profiles on old talents that maybe we just haven't gotten to, you know, Paul bear earlier in the month and nails. And of course, soon enough this weekend, hacksaw Jim Duggan, but Tito Santana next month, that should be fun. Let me give you a couple other teases too. In June, we let the good times roll with the old stuff. How about Jacques Rougeau? Yeah. Jacques Rougeau. That should be a fun show. We also got earthquake coming your way that month. I saw some requests on Twitter. Hey, are you ever going to talk about Bob Backlund? You damn right. We are in August. We're also going to cover the rock again, 99 and 2000 in September honky talk, man, Rick Martell, miss Elizabeth, Carrie Von Eric, captain Lou Albano, King Kong Bundy, Nikolai Volkov, Eddie Guerrero, Ray Mysterio. Uh, so many fun personality profiles coming your way, including Andre, the giant. You can get all these shows early and ad free at adfreeshows.com. And don't forget to check out the tier with the bonus episodes. We're working really, really hard to come up with some fun stuff for you. And I think that, uh, if you're an old school fan like me, it's going to be a great time, you know, doing a watch along with Arn Anderson seems like fun. And not only do we have that one with him and Tully winning the tag belts from 88, but his only title shot. Uh, happened in 93. We're going to do that one later this year and great American bash where he lost the belt to uh renegade hilarious stuff. Some of this stuff was like a fever dream on the 83 week side of things. Some of those bonus episodes, including the one in may is going to be where Eric Bischoff teamed up with Matt Hardy to wrestle the young bucks. Yeah, that actually happened. We're having a lot of fun at adfreeshows.com. Hope you get a chance to check it out. But if it's not for you, no big deal, man. I really appreciate your guys' support here. You guys have always been down for us and supported us, and, and we hope you're digging what we're putting out here for you every week with Westwood One. Uh, this is where our bread is buttered, but uh, we heard you loud and proud when you said, man, I, I'm tired of these commercials. I want another option. Well, there you go. Adfreeshows.com. Get them early. Get them ad free. But most importantly, thank you for your support. Thanks for following the show. Thanks for downloading us, and thanks for sticking with us during these unprecedented times but uh, hacksaw jim duggan coming your way later this weekend right here on something to wrestle with bruce pritchard no i'm not doing the poncho via thing you're on your own stay safe everybody oh and watch the draft roll tide Hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30-year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money. It's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com.